Hello and welcome to today's EcoCast, Optimizing Your Virtual Infrastructure. This EcoCast is produced by Actual Tech Media, and on this event you'll hear from experts at Open Systems, DataCore, Flexential, Nutanix, Pure Storage, and NetApp. We have an awesome event lined up for you today. Uh, this is going to be really educational, really cool stuff. I've seen all the content ahead of time, so uh, I can confidently say uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. This is a completely live event. If you haven't been on an EcoCast or Megacast event series before, uh, welcome. Uh, you should know that this is a uh, educational event for you as IT professionals to learn about the latest and greatest in enterprise technology to help you to do it quickly and efficiently from the comfort of your, ho your own home or office and to help you get all your questions answered, to help you solve your technology challenges that you might be experiencing in your IT organization and you have a chance to win some cool prizes as well. Uh, my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media and I'm excited to be your moderator on today's event. Before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping here that we first need to cover. Uh, you should know that, like I said, we've got some cool prizes. I'll talk about those in just a moment. Uh, we want you to get your questions answered, and you do that there in the questions tab. It's just to the right of the handouts tab, and I can make it move around a little bit so, uh, to call your attention to it. Uh, just click on the word questions, and it's there that you enter your questions about today's topics and presentations. We'll be doing dedicated Q&A sessions with each of today's presenters, so get your questions in early. Of course, thank you everyone for all your comments. Uh, good morning uh, to Josh, uh, Chris, Al, uh, everyone out there who's saying good morning. We, of course, always appreciate those wonderful comments. Uh, thank you to our audience so much for joining us and supporting us on these events today. We also want this to be a social event. I'll be tweeting about the event over on Twitter. You can tweet directly from the console on the bottom of the screen using the Twitter icon, and the hashtag for today's event will be automatically appended. The hashtag is ATMEcoCast. I'll remind you of that here in just a moment as well. And then finally, we have handouts. On the left-hand side there, there are a number of PDFs and links as well. I'll call your attention to those. You can go ahead and download those now. and peruse them after the event, share them with your friends and family, and um, have some additional resources about the topics that are being presented. We'll be giving out three Amazon $500 gift cards on the event, and to be eligible for those, you must be live in attendance. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, the drawing has already occurred. The grand prize winners of these gift cards must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media, and we'll reach out to you via email after the event to deliver the prize. The price terms and conditions can be found at our website, events.actualtechmedia.com. In fact, the link to that is in the handouts tab as well. Now, Actual Tech Media has been uh, donating $500 to direct relief for every megacast, ecocast, and summit event that we run until COVID-19 is beat. Uh, direct relief is supporting frontline health professionals, medical professionals, with the supplies that they need. And if you would like to donate to them as well, we of course encourage you to do that. We also uh, have been supporting uh, previously, before we started our direct relief sponsorship, uh, the charities you see on the screen there in support uh, or with partnership by the Gorilla.Guide Book Club. So check out the Gorilla.Guide Book Club uh, to download free IT technology books. Uh, of your choosing. There's a ton of great resources out there on gorilla.guide. Uh, as I said, my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow Actual Tech Media as well. And the hashtag on Twitter for today's event is ATM Ecocast. Feel free to subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook, and 10 on Tech podcast. You can find links to those in the top right hand corner of your console. You'll see icons there that say LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, we post all of our latest and greatest info on LinkedIn, so I highly encourage you to follow that one as well. And now it's time for our keynote presentation. I'm excited to welcome back our friend Ned Bellavance, who is a Pluralsight author, uh, former director of uh, cloud consulting. Uh, he's a podcaster, blogger, uh, has years of experience in the industry. And today he's going to talk to us about four keys to a consistent hybrid experience. 
Uh, this will just take a few minutes. Uh, it's a really uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Ned, we'll hand it over to you. Hey, everybody. This is Ned Bellavance, and this is Four Keys to a Consistent Hybrid Experience, both in the cloud and on premises. Now, let me set the stage for this presentation a little bit by talking about what you usually see in most marketing decks and the way that people talk about tools for the public cloud. They assume a greenfield deployment, and we all know that's not the reality. You're not a net new company. You're not building from scratch in the cloud. At least most of you aren't. You already have some level of infrastructure deployed in your on-prem data center. And along with that deployment, you also have one or more tools. And those tools are used to manage various aspects of your data center. You have your networking tools, whether it's an automation tool like Ansible or a vendor tool to go in and program things at the CLI. You have provisioning software that helps you deploy virtual machine images and desktop images. You have your monitoring systems and you probably have more than one monitoring system if we're being completely honest. We all know that monitoring systems tend to accrue a little bit. You might have one or more different storage arrays that you're managing with different pieces of software, plus your virtualization stack. And that's not even mentioning what you use for backing stuff up or your ticketing system. You already have a lot of tools. Moving to the cloud should not mean that you are introducing a whole bunch of new tools to that toolbox because in all likelihood, you have plenty already. Now you might swap out one of these tools for a new tool, but that means that that tool needs to work both on premises and in the cloud. See what we have here is a bit of a divide when it comes to traditional data center on premises processes and deployments and the way that you tend to approach things when it comes to the public cloud. When you think about the public cloud, you might be thinking about things like cloud native, automation, CICD, DevOps, all those fun and fancy buzzwords. And they're not just fun and fancy. They actually are real processes and procedures that can be used in the cloud. But guess what? You can also use some of those processes and procedures in your on-premises data center. So there's a transference there from cloud native thinking down to your data center. Vice versa, the traditional workloads that you might be running in your data center today, you may want to extend them or move them to the public cloud. And you're going to be taking those traditional virtual machines and moving them and probably not changing them a whole lot, at least at first. So what we have is a gap between the cloud way of doing things and the traditional data center way of doing things. And in that gap lies the opportunity to adopt new tool sets for a consistent hybrid experience. What do those tools look like? Well, the first thing to think about when it comes to those tools is it has to manage both on premises technology and cloud technology. It's not gonna be a very good hybrid tool if it can't do both. So that's really table stakes. Take for instance, if you are adopting storage, both in the cloud and on premises, wouldn't it be really nice if your storage solution had a consistent management experience across both environments? Hmm, that would be kind of nice. The next big thing to consider is that your solution should provide some level of APIs and CI CD integration. And this is the cloud native coming back down to the data center. The way that you want to interact with your modern tool sets is probably going to be through some kind of API and integrating it with some DevOps tool sets. So your tool of choice needs to have these key integrations to work with the cloud and hopefully to work with your own premises. The next thing is, I, it's, I guess it's less obvious, but it's an absolute must have when it comes to picking a tool. It needs to have a single unified interface for both your on-premises deployments and your cloud deployments. That doesn't mean I go to one portal when I wanna do something in Azure and a different one when it's AWS and yet another one when it's on-prem, but it's still the same tool. It's not. If I have to go to three different screens to accomplish the same goal in my three different environments, it's not a multi-cloud tool it does not meet my requirements. 
So it needs to be a single interface across all these different environments. And lastly, the fourth big consideration is that it needs to be a tool that is available both as a service or as an on-premises deployment. A hosted solution removes the administrative burden of you having to deploy that solution and maintain it ongoing. And that is the perfect model for an overburdened IT staff that doesn't need yet another tool that needs care and feeding. But you may be in a regulated industry or in a situation where you want your collected data to live on-prem. And in that case, there also needs to be an on-prem deployment version of whatever tool you're currently evaluating. So if we want to review my four keys to a consistent hybrid experience, first, you really, it needs to manage on-prem and cloud. If it doesn't do that, it doesn't meet the table stakes. Secondly, you're going to want to integrate this into your automation tool chains. And that means it needs to have APIs and CI CD integration. Next, it needs to be a single interface. You don't want to be jumping to different windows and trying to remember which window works with which environment. No, it needs to be a single interface. And lastly, it needs a hosted or on-prem deployment model. Both of those need to be available for you to pick the one that suits you best. So those are my thoughts on what you need for a consistent hybrid experience. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter and NedInTheCloud.com. Really cool presentation there from Ned. Uh, always good to have you on, Ned. Thank you so much. Um, and I've, I mean, Ned was talking about challenges with hybrid cloud primarily. I'm curious now, I've just brought up a poll question for you. And that is, which of these are your greatest IT challenge right now? And you can select multiple, of course. And I'm, I'll be sharing the results of this with you so you can see how you stack up with your peers. So uh, this should be interesting. I'll give you a minute to answer this. All right, we've got a lot of votes coming in. Thank you, everyone. Let me go ahead and share the results of this. And let's take a look at that. So 50% said security. That was the single greatest IT challenge that uh, people are facing on today's event. And we have hundreds of people on the event today. A second after that, looks like 32% was performance and capacity, followed by 30% that said budgeting and cost control. After that, uh, remote work challenges, 22%, 20% staffing, 22% said data protection and disaster recovery. So very interesting. Thank you for sharing your feedback on that. And now here's one more question before I introduce you to our first presenter. And the question on the screen is, when do you plan to add new or update existing IT solutions at your company? If you're on the event today, is this something um, your, your uh, virtual infrastructure that you're looking to optimize? Is this something you're planning to do uh, immediately in the next six months or uh, one of the other time frames there on the poll question? If you have any question, or pro, sorry, if you have any trouble with the poll question, uh, just try refresh on your web browser. And I want to remind everyone that Chrome is the recommended web browser. And with that, it's time to kick off today's EcoCast with our first presenter. I'm excited to introduce Sylvan Chop, Head of Solutions Architecture at Open Systems. Sylvan, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you for being on. Take it away. Awesome. So hello, everyone, also from my side. Um, as just mentioned by David, I'm heading the Solution Architecture um, team at Open Systems. And I'm very excited to talk to you today about how SASE can help you to optimize your virtual infrastructure. While some of my fellow presenters um, after me in, in that webinar may focus on solutions around virtual virtualization technologies, my talk approaches um, the topic from a slightly different angle. I'm looking into how an optimized network architecture can support your ongoing or your future virtualization initiatives. So that's why we first quickly look into what are some of the driving forces that we see um, in, in our space these days. And then we'll look at SASE in general and the modern Massive N architecture, more specifically, 
can support virtualization and virtual infrastructure projects. So cloud and mobility, those are two trends that, that we see everywhere uh, in the market these days, especially in today's situation around COVID-19. Um, everybody has felt that um, firsthand. And it really is multifold here. We see that pretty much every enterprise is adopting cloud um, in one way or another. It's a multi-cloud strategy. Multi-cloud meaning that this could, could be um, in different clouds, that they deploy infrastructure or platform as a service in different cloud environments. It could be that they mix different types of cloud deployments, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, um, or it could just be that they adopt one cloud provider, for example, Microsoft, Azure, and they just leverage multiple services um, in multiple different um, uh, ways from, from an Azure platform. So there is many ways how a multi-cloud strategy um, can look like these days, but it's pretty much present in, in every company. It's also that not only data and applications move to the cloud, and hence they need to be accessed or they are spread everywhere, but it's also that we see people access these data and applications from anywhere. So people are on the road, they are working from home, they are traveling users, not too much these days, but still it is a driving force. So it is not that users are just confined to either the headquarter or some branch office anymore but they literally need to be able to access the data and applications um, from anywhere. And that basically results that applications or the requirement for, for access principles is from anywhere, like any user, any endpoint, any device needs to be accessed to any data that can potentially be hosted anywhere. The challenge with this especially on a network level, is that this has direct impact on, on security. It's not that you can have a, a security perimeter that is controlled in your, in your main data center that where you route all the traffic through that and, and you control your security um, perimeter at one or maybe two or three instances globally, but you literally have a, a security perimeter that is more and more um, dissolving. So it becomes less and less um, irrelevant, but on the other hand, the requirements for security, for compliance, um, are increasing every day. So while we see that users are spread everywhere, applications are hosted everywhere, security is more and more difficult to ensure, uh, to enforce, but still we need to have it in place to make sure that we stay compliant as, as companies and enterprises. Now, what does it mean for, for virtualized infrastructure in particular? It's uh, listed those three main challenges that I feel that are relevant for probably most of you. Um, first of all, the question is about localization. Where do you host your virtual infrastructure? Do you still rely on some on-premise data center or have you already moved part of that to the cloud? If yes, what is the model? Do you use software as a service or do you just um, do a lift and shift approach and have your existing virtual infrastructure um, hosted in Azure or AWS. How do you expect users to access it? Do they still connect somewhat to your WAN and then access it over WAN infrastructure? Do they access it directly over the internet? So there's many questions around where you host your own infrastructure and how it is made accessible to your users. And then the direct implication of that decision is the performance. How can you continue to provide the best performance and user experience to your user and business? How can you guarantee that it's a massive change in, in architecture is not having or is actually having a better implication or a better result for your end user experience? And last but not least, I mentioned it before, with all the business demands and all the changes that you want to do to make user experience better, you still have the challenge to make sure that you stay secure, that you stay compliant, and that you kind of 
um, enable or empower users to do what they need from a business perspective, but that you, from an IT point of view, are still under control the way you need to be um, to also sleep peacefully at night. So that's kind of the main drivers that we see in the market these days, and that's kind of where I want to now dig into um, SASE as a concept, and I'll go into it right in a minute what SASE is about and why um, SASE as a framework, as a mindset, might give you some ideas how you can approach those challenges that we just looked at. So SASE, it stands for Secure Access Service Edge and um, has been introduced as a framework by Gartner um, last summer. So around August 2019, Gartner came up with that proposal of um, combining network, networking as a service and security as a service. So those two um, domains, I'd say they were primarily distinct before that. They were different technologies, they had different goals, different targets, typically were handled by different teams within organizations. And most often we, we see within our customers as well that those teams have even had conflicting goals. While the network team wanted to be agile, they, they needed to support the business to um, connect new branch sites or integrate a new company or connect users to that new SaaS application, security obviously wants to um, take things slowly and make sure everything stays compliant. So that's where SASE really changes the mindset and say, hey, as an enterprise, you can only be successful in today's world if you think about these two domains as one, if you handle them with one shared goal of enabling your business, of fighting against or supporting the trends um, around cloud and mobility, and hence have a framework ready that, um, that you can answer or that can help you answer those um, challenges. An important piece here is what, what also is specifically mentioned by Gartner is that those services, they, they should be provided as a service. So it's not necessarily um, buying technology, stitching them together, um, have various technologies one after the other as we've been used to for many years. So the, the true benefit of SAS is having it under one holistic umbrella as one unified solution, and that's where where the sum is definitely better than just the, or the total is better than the sum of the individual components. In the end, the, the way it is delivered or SASE is delivered these days is, is a hybrid cloud native platform. And what that means is that no matter what your environment looks like, be it you're fully cloud native already, or be it that you have lots of on-site production facilities, users on the road, um, IoT devices that need access to, to your applications. The goal really is that SASE platforms can support all the, the different needs um, holistically. So you can have hardware appliances at your critical branch offices, but you can then also have um, uh, software as a service delivered from the cloud for your remote users. So the combination of this, the integration into one global picture, that's really what, what is the, the main um, key, key driver, the key differentiator of a SASE framework compared to what was done um, uh, in the past few years. So it really should simplify architecture. It should simplify um, the way of management because, again, it is provided as a service and health provides you the, the agility and the flexibility that today's businesses demand. Now, where does the security come into play? And I kind of mentioned it um, slightly before with the fact that you can now say you, you either look at it from a heavy edge perspective. So you say that instead of having one single security um, portfolio or security stack in your data center, you replicate that to each of your branch sites. And by replicating, I don't mean that you have to deploy physical hardware to everywhere and that you have to maintain your entire rack of security appliances at each of your locations, but it's really combined into that SASE platform where all those security functions are combined into one um, physical appliance. 
But then again, as we go more towards um, remote workers, small offices, or even the IoT or, or mobile devices, that's where you cannot enforce that um, security on premise or physically on the device for cost reasons, for technology reasons, for operational reasons. And that's where you can benefit of having the same security stack deployed to a cloud environment. And hence, provide that functionality of um, zero trust um, ideas that no matter what device you're accessing from, you have the same access principle. You might need different authentication. You might need to provide um, step-up authentication if you're suddenly dialing from a, a, a different country because you were traveling or so on and so forth. But in the end, you, you empower users to have same user experience no matter where they access data from and on what device they access data from. So that's high level the high-level view of what SASC is about and why we really feel that uh, this is a framework that's, that can provide answers to, um, to do today's challenges. And what I want to go now into a bit more specific is um, SASC WAN architecture. And this primarily focuses on the connectivity piece because, again, I mentioned before, the localization is, is a big challenge when we come down to, to virtual infrastructure. So the question is, how do you connect, or first of all, where do you deploy your virtual infrastructure, and how do you connect your users? Do you leverage MPLS networks? Do you leverage um, plain internet, the direct internet access lines, broadband lines, no matter where the users are? Um, that's the most agile these days. But the more you go down the internet road, the more you need capabilities um, to ensure that you have control over your business applications, that you can access your applications that are hosted in the cloud, and that you provide your business some sort of improved uh, connectivity as, as you are running global applications and global user bases. So for example, when we had open systems, we partnered with um, Microsoft to say, okay, we can provide our customers access to the, the Microsoft global network that we say we can connect users and branch offices to, the, to Azure, um, depending on, on the, the various requirements, get them to the nearest Azure location, and from there leverage the Microsoft Global Network to traverse um, the globe, to traverse from one continent to the other, and that's typically where the highest latency comes from, and that's where <clears throat> you benefit most from um, from optimized peering, from optimized latency, and, and reduction of packet loss. Now, while Microsoft has one of the strongest backbones um, globally that can be leveraged um, very cost effectively, there's many cases where, um, where you don't have access to. For example, what if you um, are operating in a hybrid cloud environment? What if you need access to Salesforce, or you need access to to your Google Cloud or, or Amazon instances. And that's where we've also partnered with, um, with Equinix primarily, that, uh, that is today the leader in connecting um, dozens, if not hundreds, of cloud service providers, where we can say we <clears throat> seamlessly integrate all those cloud providers together with the Equinix fabric into your global WAN. So having such combinations or using leveraging your local internet lines together with decent backbones that, that help you stay flexible, help you stay agile, depending on where your business go, depending on what your customers require, this is really what leverages or what enables you to, to be flexible enough and meet the business demands. Now, just to go a little bit more into some technical intricacies here for, for those that are familiar with SD-WAN, that's probably nothing new, but it's still important to, to always remind yourself of what actually the benefit or the goal is of, having, um, of implementing such a solution. In the end, the goal of SD-WAN is that you can protect your most business-critical applications that you can ensure that no matter what happens in your network, maybe a line is going down or maybe there is some congestion somewhere, that you can protect your most critical applications. And this is done by, first of all, you need to understand what is going on. 
you need to have the visibility. And, and again, by having SD-WAN implemented in your network, you can immediately understand what applications um, your business is dealing with. And then, based on that understanding, you can start to, to apply control to it. You can start to apply QoS bandwidth control across your network and make sure that if there is congestion or if suddenly a user is starting a YouTube stream, that this does not have impact on your SAP or on your Microsoft Teams wipe call and so on and so forth. So really have the benefit to, through the insight into your application landscape, make sure that you can control that end-to-end. -end. Then also, with bandwidth control comes path selection. You want to be able to make sure you leverage multiple connections. Um, there might not always be one connection that is best for all connectivity. So leveraging this on a global scale and be sure that your applications are routed over different links based on, on the specific needs of those applications. That's really how, how you can, <clears throat> can make sure. Sorry for that. Um, how you can make sure to, to have an optimal path and ensure your applications um, are fitting the business needs and the user experience that the users expect. So that was just a kind of a sneak peek into what you can do with the right SD-WAN architecture to really support those um, connectivity to the cloud from your branch sites, from users on the road, you connect them to your nearest entrance, your nearest pop, and then have them enabled to leverage the same capabilities on, on a local scale where needed, but obviously also on a global scale. And that's in the end what Open System SASE solution looks like. Um, we're, we've been a pioneer in <clears throat> combining network and security services. Um, We've, we've been doing that since the, the early 1990s. So this is really kind of our core competency, and, and Gartner has now provided us that platform to really excel and to thrive and to, to have that confirmation that we've been on the right path um, there. We leverage our platform to provide a, a holistic service for, for our customers to not only provide insights into what, what applications they run, but also run analytics on top that they that you get actionable insights that you can run predictive analytics and and hence have really kind of predictable or pre <coughs> actionable results taken out of it. The most important piece is the co-managed operations, managing such a huge complexity, manage such a dynamic environment needs a good partner. You need to have um, access to engineers that can help you. Uh, we all struggle with talent scarcity today uh, with um, know-how or resources. So having access to, to level three support to support you in, in challenging or in connecting and securing your applications, that's really a core competency of ours. And where we've also seen now in these days where we've got plenty of very positive feedback from our customers how we could help them in mastering these challenging times um, around COVID-19. That brings me to the Q&A. Excellent presentation, Sylvan. Uh, we do have some questions here for you. Uh, while we do that, I'm just going to bring up a poll question for the audience. So the question on the screen says, uh, what additional information would you like about the open systems solution? So we'll just leave that up. Let's see, first question that came in, uh, Rendy's asking is, uh, how do you provide multi-platform access to private cloud networks? Uh, he says that can, prov that can prove challenging across complex private cloud architectures. Can, SD -WAN, can an SD-WAN solution answer this problem? Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so it's um, obviously we cannot, or SD-WAN doesn't solve the problem of um, multiple users working on a, on the same file, and that there is conflicts there. I think there is plenty of solutions out there that um, that handle this um, better or worse, depending on the approach. I think what helps with the, the SASE approach is that things like um, or one component of, of 
SaaS ES um, cloud access security brokers. And those can help you, especially in, in governing cloud applications, especially in governing um, what data is accessed by your users. Um, we've seen in one of the slides before that um, typically less than 5% of uh, applications in, a, in an enterprise are IT sanctioned. So there's a lot of shadow IT around. And <clears throat> you'd be surprised how many applications your users are using that are probably not re, um, compliant with your internal regulations or even your industry regulations or government regulations. So having insight into the application landscape, knowing where the biggest risks are, this really helps you to, um, to do some or to kind of react on some of these challenges and be more reactive, again, uh, proactive <laughs> instead of being reactive. Excellent, excellent, okay, that makes sense. Uh, let's see, next question they're asking is, um, you mentioned that this approach supports multi-cloud setups. Can you repeat why this is the case? So in the end, if there is other SASE providers you would see out in the space that, um, that have their own cloud environments, that have you as a company connect or your users connect to the, the company's pops and entry points which which has certain benefits for sure, but it also limits you in um, kind of you always have to go through that additional cloud. In our approach, we say you want to have your users as close to where your eventual data is, be it in Azure, be it in AWS, be it a SaaS provider. We want you to provide you the optimal path to the application given where the user is, but still staying secure and compliant. So really, we assume that every enterprise is, is in a multi-cloud environment, and hence we need to make sure that both from a connectivity as well as from a security standpoint, this requirement is supported. Okay, that makes sense. Another question here, they said, I've never heard of SASE before. This sounds interesting, but could be complex. How difficult is it to adopt this solution? Yeah, it's actually a question we get quite often uh, because it uh, um, seems very intimidating, especially if you look at it at first hand. But the, the beauty about SASE is it's, it's not a product. It's not a product that you buy today and implement tomorrow. Um, so it's, it's a mindset. It's a framework, and you can, can do as big of a step or as small of a step towards that direction as, as fits best your, your current situation. But that also means that it is not an easy way of, of doing so. It's not just some downloading a software, deploying to all your users, and, and you're done. But in the end, is it's really you need to look at or analyze where you are today. Um, you need to understand where you're, you are as a company in your digital transformation journey, what your goals are, and where you want to go, and what are the lowest hanging fruits you can do. We see a lot of customers, they start with ripping out the RAMPS lines and implement the internet only, because that's, that's where typically a lot of cost um, benefit comes from. And others have their firewalls up for renewal and don't want to invest into, uh, into global firewall um, technologies again. So we really see, and obviously a third example now with um, COVID, we've seen that um, uh, work from home has suddenly been at huge demand and companies needed answers to this from, from one day to the other. So there is many different entry points into, into going sassy or becoming sassy. And what you need to be aware of is to have or select the right provider, select the right partner to support you along that journey, that you're not suddenly locked in with specific technology that doesn't help you to advance as you're as, um, the, um, the business needs changes, but really have a strategic partner that can join you or accompany you on that journey or that path towards SASE. Yeah, great point, great point. And this question is kind of along those same lines. Um, is, it, is SASE a solution that runs on-prem or in the cloud or, or both? It's both. It is a cloud, it is cloud delivered, but in the end it's, it always is hybrid. It, I have not seen a company that has run everything from the cloud because in the end you high likely have um, some on-prem uh, environment.
environment still, be it a data center or be it branch offices that need to be secured. So we, we always see a very hybrid mode that also changes. So it can be primarily hybrid today, um, shifting towards the cloud and be primarily cloud um, in two or three years' time. So that's really the beauty about SASE. Excellent, excellent. So um, what should people do to get started with open systems? What do you recommend typically as the first step? Well, reach out to us, um, visit our website, um, engage in understand your needs where you are today or just kind of talk about it in more detail. Um, there is a handout that, that is available um, that shows a little bit at a glance who we are as a company. And um, yeah, let's, let's start a conversation and take it from there. Excellent, excellent, all right. Well, that's all the questions we have. A really great presentation. Thank you so much for being on, Sylvan. Thank you, everyone. For more information on the Open System Solution, check out the PDF that's available there in your Handouts tab. And of course, uh, you know, visit the Open Systems uh, website as well, which is open-systems.com. And now it's time for our next presenter on today's EcoCast. That is Mr. Craig Cook, Vice President of Solutions Architecture and Engineering at Flexential. Craig, are you there? I am. Good morning. Good morning. Good Thanks for being on, for Craig. Time. Absolutely, yeah. Take it away. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, all right. Good morning, everybody, uh, and good afternoon to some uh, out east. So. My name is Craig Cook. I head up the, the solutions architecture and engineering team. Uh, I'm excited to be here today. Um, you know, as you can see, we're going to kind of talk through a couple things as it relates to, to optimizing your virtual infrastructure. So, um, you know, we've got a number of solutions I'll, I'll walk through and some of the trends we're seeing in the industry and uh, just, you know, have a chance to kind of share a little bit about what we come across. And then, uh, you know, at the end, we'll talk through and uh, answer questions and, uh, you know, Take it from uh, take it from there. So let's uh, let's dive in. So I head up the uh, the solutions engineering practice. As I said, um, you know, we are a leading hybrid IT service provider in, in North America. This, this won't be a long commercial, but for those that aren't aware, uh, I just want to give you a, a quick overview of our capabilities. So you know, as that leading provider, you know, that starts for us with our national national platform and, and that platform is all about providing choice and flexibility for our customers. When you want to place your workloads in, in that closest proximity to your customers, we will get you there, right? Whether that platform includes 40 data centers and over 3 million square feet of, uh, of floor space, we provide a, a broad and always expanding reach to, uh, to your current and future deployments. Our capabilities go beyond just power cooling and, and space though. When you want that seamless user experience, you've got to have a network that can, can keep up and, and be the engine room really for keeping your environments and your applications running effectively. So we've got a scalable, redundant, private network backbone that spans the entire country. Uh, it currently uh, runs at 100 gig, scalable up to 400 gigabits per second, designed to accommodate large traffic spikes without sacrificing latency and performance for your applications. So that range of connectivity options, we can enable all of your networking requirements. We leverage that network to deliver cloud solutions to our customers. We've got a robust set of cloud regions across the US that provide multi-tenant and hybrid cloud solutions as well as single-tenant private cloud solutions. Right, so cloud can be great for, for a lot of things, but it, it hasn't solved for the speed of light and application latency is a painful thing for users. So putting your applications in a, in a location as close to your users as possible, you can help ensure a great experience for them. In addition to those cloud nodes, we've got ultra low latency uh, disaster recovery solutions that we provide through the nodes you see here. We've got five spread across the country. And then in addition to that, we tie into a lot of the local carrier hotels and, and POP. So POP is a point of presence, um, which really is a physical access point at those carrier hotels across the country where the ISPs, the, the business networks, and, and all the carriers really come in and, and connect uh, and build what is, you know, the fabric of the internet and, and you know, all the enterprise WANs that are out there. 
these key points of presence augment our flex central own network capabilities and, and they seamlessly expand the interconnection capabilities for our customers. In addition to that, we've got on-ramp capabilities for connecting to the hyperscale cloud platforms such as AWS, Azure, Google, and Oracle. This is an area of ongoing investment for Flexential and this map is continuously evolving. For those of you with international customers or business partners, you know, our data centers give you the closest point of access to some of the latest, fastest undersea cables connecting Asia and the South Pacific, as well as great access to Europe and South America. Ultimately, what we provide are IT solutions that can flex over time, a mix of co-location, cloud, managed services, data protection, and a large team of professional services consultants who can help with the you know, design, the migration, the implementation, whatever it might be that, to, that you need to kind of bring it all together to augment your teams in, in getting there faster. That's, that's enough from a commercial standpoint. Let's kind of dive into the, uh, you know, the, the meat of the presentation today. And so, you know, when we talk about optimizing our virtual infrastructure, there's a, there's a few things that happen there. And obviously it depends where you are in your journey as a customer, but, you know, most customers are moving into that heavily virtualized side of the spectrum and, and really looking at things like, you know, containers as an example, right? We're seeing a lot of this right now where, you know, they, they've become a very big thing lately. You know, it's one of the latest sort of trends and buzzwords, and, and I'm gonna dive in and talk a little bit about why that is. Before I get straight to containers, I just wanna talk about some of the, the things in general as it relates to public cloud. The, the benefits of, <clears throat> excuse me, the benefits of cloud are well known, right? So things like elasticity and agility and standardized components, you know, things like that are, are, are very well known these days and we've been talking about them for years. But there are often challenges as well, right? Most enterprises have spent, you know, years, even decades and, and millions and millions of dollars developing their people, their processes and their technologies, that, you know, for their IT platforms. And the challenge that many of these organizations have in the public cloud is that those processes and technologies, they don't always extend into those. They're not necessarily designed for them. They don't, uh, they have never, were never taken into account. Um, never mind the fact that the people may not have the experience and the skill sets with those technologies and those architectures and those best practices. And that presents ultimately challenges from a security perspective, but obviously from an operational efficiency and delivery perspective. So all of those things, people, process, and technology, they all need to adjust. Your entire ecosystem needs to be able to support the public cloud or you're just, public, you're just plugging holes constantly with, uh, you know, with each new deployment. We think, when we think about you know, the, the world in general as it relates to containers, you know, this is a little bit of information from Gartner in terms of what they're seeing. Obviously, they do a ton of research of the market and the industry and talking to customers. Um, and you know, if you look at this, within a couple of years, it says more than 75% of, of all the global organizations out there in the enterprise are gonna be running containers in production for their applications. Now, that's in some form. That might be one application. That might be many of their applications. That might be most or all of their applications. But that's a pretty big number. Um, I don't know where all of you are that are, uh, are listening today or on that journey, whether you started down the path of containers, you've been doing it forever and you're experts, um, or whether you've heard of them and, and you, know, you just wanna to start to dabble in it. But, you know, the reason that containers have originally, you know, one of the big reasons that they, they, they've taken hold is, you know, we had this concept of server sprawl, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And, you know, that kind of, as we move into virtualization, that led to VM sprawl. And that VM sprawl, when you don't have the right processes and technologies around these things um, and the right governance, um, you know, that can lead to a lot of extra effort in terms of keeping those systems up to date. Um, that leads to potential, you know, security uh, vulnerabilities and, you know, potentially that leads to security breaches. And so, you know, one of the benefits, obviously not the only one, uh, but one of the benefits of containers is, you know, shrinking that footprint in terms of how many systems you have to patch by taking a system and being able to carve it up and, and effectively virtualize the operating system to allow you to deploy multiple application instances. And it's, 
you're simplifying and, and reducing that security, uh, you know, surface uh, attack area. You know, these other stats, you know, just talk about sort of the growth of the market and the size of the market, you know, suffice to say, they think it's, uh, it's growing pretty quickly. And, you know, 8.2 billion is, is not a huge number in some regard, but, you know, it's a relatively inexpensive technology. So, you know, it doesn't take into account the, the whole ecosystem that, that containers live within as well. And as I said, all of this is being driven by the security and operational challenges that I, that I highlighted previously. So when you look at public cloud, you know, some people decide to dive straight in, they dip their toe in the water, they might do some test dev, they might dive straight in and start developing applications. Often what we see is customers just figure, I got to get to the cloud, and so they immediately start to just lift and shift their, their infrastructure into the cloud. And, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways, obviously, you can get there. <clears throat> you know, my opinion, the, uh, you know, the most prudent way is to, to take an application workload um, view of things and, and go through a workload placement, uh, you know, um, whether you have your own framework, whether you, you leverage someone to, to develop one for you, or you leverage someone and just take what they've already learned through, uh, through their experience and, and, you know, put that framework to use against your applications. But it's about looking at those applications, understanding where they are best suited to run, what the constraints are around things like dependencies, latency, um, technologies, architecture, all of those things. And then there's a level of effort to replatforming those and, and placing them in the right, the right way. So um, you can absolutely gain all kinds of benefits and efficiency from, from going into the public cloud. The best and, and most um, valuable ones, in my opinion, are when you rewrite your applications for the cloud, when you replatform your systems and, and redesign your architectures. Now, that's very utopian. Those efforts are generally, you know, expensive, long, multi-year efforts. Um, they are absolutely worth it if you can do them. Um, lift and shift, in my opinion, and, and you know, my experience is, you know, we've seen a ton of of customers, and I've, you know, been in this industry a long time. Um, I've worked with a lot of organizations, you know, um, helping them along their journey to uh, to the cloud in some fashion. And you know, there's a lot of things that you learn from that process. Right. One of them is just the, uh, you know, the cost side of things, right? If you just take the mess you have, you lift it and shift it into the cloud, you may get some benefit from it in terms of, well, now I'm in an environment that I can spin up quickly. For some organizations, that's awesome. They can move faster. They can continue to, you know, add new systems. Um, but, there, you know, the downside of that is if you don't have the right governance in place around that, you know, that can get very expensive very quickly. Um, you know, not to mention that your applications, um, you know, typically in an enterprise infrastructure today, you design them with certain things like HA and, and uh, you know, clustering and, and resiliency. And, you know, if you don't do it properly and you just take the way you're doing it today and put it into the cloud, they don't have necessarily the same architecture and the same expectations of, of the resiliency of the platform. Um, you know, if you talk to AWS or, or Azure or Google, they, they, they state, you know, clearly in their SLAs that it's up to you to, you know, design and provision your systems in a very resilient fashion. And in order to do that, you have to have the knowledge of what architectures provide what kind of availability, what kind of resiliency. And, you know, if you don't have that skill in-house, you know, strongly, strongly recommend you engage a partner around that to help you with that whether that be the design, the architecture, the migration and implementation, or even the ongoing management of that. At Flexential, we take an, a, an approach and we leverage a framework that basically at a high level looks like this, right? It starts with consulting with you to understand your needs. It leads to architecting a solution. We implement that solution and we either can manage it for you or help you manage it in an interim state or just hand it off to you to manage if you've got that skill overall. We leverage our, our 20 plus years of experience in the industry and best practices to work with you to do all of those things I just described, but we look at it from a very holistic approach, right? It's not just about moving and lifting and shifting. It's how am I leveraging it? How am I migrating? How am I monitoring it? How am I governing it from a, from a process and a procurement and a cost management perspective? 
what sort of bursting requirements do I have? What sort of resiliency and, and continuity requirements do I have? And last but not least, you know, one of the biggest things that we, we help customers with is around the security side of that. Um, and whether that be, you know, auditing your security processes, um, you know, auditing your systems themselves, looking at vulnerabilities, doing, you know, penetration testing at a, at a you know, system or an application level. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to help in that space. When we talk about managed containers and container orchestration, you know, there's a lot of benefits that come with that. And what we do is we take all of that knowledge and experience around the public cloud and we basically have what you know, we consider to be sort of a managed DevOps approach um, where we, you know, as a service can provide all the tool sets that layer in to get you there very quickly um, and take that, that time, to, time to market, time to value for you down to, to, you know, from months and sometimes years down to weeks and, uh, you know, potentially even days. And so we've built a fully automated system that allows you to, you know, um, deploy all of the tool sets you would need to get started in DevOps if you haven't already and, and not have to worry about managing those systems. You just start, are able to start leveraging them. Part of how we're able to do that is around things like software defined everything is kind of you know the buzzword software defined is a huge buzzword and so whether it's software defined networking or software defined WAN or software defined infrastructure or data centers you know that that keeps going you know if we go back a few years it kind of started with this concept of you know there was a traditional architecture of servers networks storage that kind of thing that kind of led to hey you know can we simplify that and start to get into these converged stacks so you know, V blocks and flex pods and different flavors of, you know, a uh, more of a proprietary prescriptive infrastructure so that you as a customer need to start worrying about the infrastructure less. And as that continues to evolve, we come into things like hyperconverged and, you know, really trying to just simplify the stack overall. And what that does for us is, you know, we take those, those servers and that storage and you know when you start to simplify that into and, and put all that capability and functionality into singular pieces of hardware and really think of them as you know ultimately appliances in some cases they are in some cases they're you know they're a little bit different but you know what is an appliance really it's it's a combination of hardware and software um, to form something and it's just a matter of you know how prescriptive it is and, and really how configurable it is and you know th this this is a world that continues to evolve in a, in a great way um, but the point of it is that really it allows you to focus on your logical applications and not so much on the infrastructure itself and so whether you choose to deploy that in your own environments or in a co-location facility and, and manage that or whether you choose to to go to somebody like flexential and and you know leverage a, a private cloud platform based on hyperconverged um, you know, you get the benefit of the, the power of those policies and automation and the simplification so that you focus on your applications, which for most of you is, is where you want to be as, as a business, at least. Um, you know, in IT, that, that sometimes presents challenges because, you know, people that are network admins or server admins or storage admins start to go, well, what exactly is it that I'm going to be doing? And so, you know, there's obviously some things there that have to shift in terms of people's skill sets. Potentially, there's a shift from you know working for an enterprise to working for a service provider, um, but that world continues to to go and grow. And you know, as people go through the continuum of getting out of the data center business and getting out of the infrastructure business, and in some cases, getting out of the IT business, um, you know, there's there's a, a, a spectrum that we see customers, you know, and as part of that journey to the cloud, that's really what it what it looks like. So, you know, this is an interesting one in terms of, you know, we talked about software defined storage and where that market is going. Um, you know, at a high level, if you look at this, it's pretty simple, right? The storage growth is continuing at a fairly rapid pace overall. And traditional storage, you know, methodologies are giving way to more of a software defined approach. A little bit, dig a little bit deeper into that and, and what you see is sort of you know that that same thing so that middle section is that traditional storage that's shrinking and in the top and bottom sections there you know the top represents kind of the hyperscale infrastructure side of things and you know what they what sort of growth you're you're seeing and expecting there from that 
And then the bottom side is the sort of the enterprise version of that. So whether that be, you know, a VMware solution or Nutanix or SimpliVity, you know, there's a lot of these types of, uh, <coughs> pardon me, there's a lot of these types of solutions out there that, um, you know, you can very easily kind of, you know, own and implement or, or have, like I said, a, a sort of a, a private cloud platform that you build yourself or, you know, you, you uh, subscribe to from somebody like Flexential. Transitioning into one of the, the last topics here that I'll talk about today, and, and it's really, you know, that there's never been a better time for BDI, in my opinion. Um, you know, I think it was 15 years ago, I was flown to California to work with the very first product managers at VMware, and, and BDI wasn't a, a term yet. Um, we called it, at that time, enterprise-hosted desktops. And we had built a solution for a couple of our customers, and VMware was like, well, that's a really interesting use case. We haven't seen anybody try and put desktops on top of a virtualized infrastructure. Come tell us more about it. My, my background prior to that was as a, as a Citrix architect, so I've spent a lot of time in that server-based computing world. But if you look at what's going on in the world today, never mind the industry, um, you know, this is just some quick snippets of, of headlines from last week, right? And it's Every one of them is about, you know, what's going on with COVID. And obviously, we're all very, very familiar with that and the impact it's having. You know, many of you guys may have already had a work-from-home solution. Um, if not, you've probably been asked about, you know, how do you enable a work-from-home solution? And so I want to talk a little bit about that today and, and some of the things that are out there. And so virtual desktops are a great way to solve for this. They're a standardized, secure method of provisioning your applications for your users. Um, you know, for those that are already doing it, you probably are doing it for some subset. If you're in maybe healthcare or, you know, the financial world, maybe there's a large percentage of your users that are already leveraging, um, you know, virtual desktops and, and uh, remote desktops. Um, it's been a standard in a lot of different industries. If you're, a, you know, a distributed uh, company with a lot of field offices, you're probably, probably leveraging something similar to this, whether it be, you know, um, hosted desktops or, uh, you know, just a, a, a Citrix, traditional Citrix type of infrastructure. Ultimately, you know, this, this solution overall is about being able to provide production BDI. Um, that could be in your premises, in your co-location facility, or leveraging our platform. Um, and in, in the production side of things, or in the DR side of things, you know, a lot of DR for, for BDI is something that's, that's kind of interesting. You know, there's a lot of DR as a service providers out there, um, and, and Flexential is, is one of the leading ones. But we've, we've often historically struggled with, well, how, what do we do for VDI? And most customers, what they do is they end up, if I need 10,000 users of capacity in production, you know, I probably need somewhere between eight and 10,000 users of capacity in DR. And in places like healthcare, where it's life and death, um, you know, you probably have 100% of that capacity. So effectively, you have two times the capacity you need. And in the world of cloud and automation, what we provide for our customers is the ability to, you know, sail into and leverage a, uh, you know, what I would consider to be or describe as an oversubscribed environment so that you only have to pay for the minimum amount you need to ensure that you can get that environment up and running very, very quickly in the event that something happens to your production environment. And so this is something that we've seen a lot of interest in, especially with COVID, um, you know, just being able to, to tap into that as needed and, uh, you know, rapidly scale your, uh, your environment. Lastly, I'll just close with, with this. Um, you know, today's environments are, are obviously changing rapidly and, and quite dramatically. The technology that's critical to your business is becoming more complex. Those workloads are growing larger and more distributed, and demands are increasing as the expectations continue to rise higher than ever. With everything as a service expected, the role of the IT leader is expanded, and to survive in these, these highly dynamic hybrid, and hybrid IT environments, your businesses must be flexible and able to adapt quickly. At Flexential, it's our business to solve complex IT challenges. We recognize that one size does not fit all for you and that your IT requirements are constantly evolving. Our team of solution engineers and architects and professional services consultants begin by taking the time to understand both your current requirements and your future objectives, 
and we'll work with you to tailor a solution that's right for you. That brings me to the end of my presentation. So I'll, uh, I'll pause there and, and ask uh, what, uh, what questions folks have. Absolutely, yeah, great presentation, Craig. Um, let's do some Q&A now. We do have some questions for you. And we'll just bring up this poll while we do the, uh, the Q&A here for the audience. So everyone check out the poll on the screen. What additional info would you like about the Flux Central solution? So let's see, first question that came in, uh, Rodney's asking, uh, what would be the advantage of Flux Central over using just a, a common cloud provider that, um, you know, in the public cloud, for example? Sure, we get we get that question a lot, and and the reality is, you know, it, it depends. Um, in some cases, we're we're the right to, or, or better solution. In some cases, those those public providers are. And, and I go back to kind of what I talked about at the beginning around workload placement and the application. So if your methodology is to lift and shift, then you know, I, I would just say you want to be sure you're doing that for the right reasons. Um, if you're lifting shifting to a public cloud provider who's got a location that's very close to you and your users and, and you're going to get great performance around that, maybe that's the right the right thing to do. Um, you know, if if you're just going for the sake of it because you know everybody it seems to be looking at the you know uh, the hyperscalers and that seems to be the safe choice, you really need to look at your application, the latency, you know, the dependencies. The architecture, you know, 99% of the applications you have, especially if you're a business that's more than probably five or 10 years old, your applications are what I would describe as, as you know, legacy applications. They're not cloud native. They weren't written for cloud. They don't take advantage of services within, you know, the AWS, Azure's, and Google's of the world. Um, if they do, great. That is a perfect place to put, you know, to put those applications. If they're not taking advantage of those those features and functionality, though, you've got to ask yourself, why am I putting it there? Um, because more often than not, it's not it's not going to be co uh, more cost effective for you. Um, what we're finding is more and more enterprises are putting the majority of their legacy applications in an enterprise private cloud with somebody like us if they don't want to, you know, build and manage that stuff themselves. Um, but the uh, you know the the, the main advantages, I would say, is just that, right? There's overall cost effectiveness when you look at it holistically. There's application performance from a latency perspective in terms of where are your users and how close are your, your cloud uh, environments to your users. And then there's flexibility and, and that hybrid nature of them, right? Most of your environments, and you don't have the ability to just light switch, say, all my applications are magically replatformed or rewritten. And so being able to have, uh, you know, a mix of co-location, private cloud, public cloud with, you know, high-speed connectivity between them, um, you know, that's, a, that's what most organizations are, are dealing with in terms of their reality. Um, you know, the path to the public cloud is generally, you know, a, a long one for, for customers in terms of really deriving the value and the, and, and the promise of it. Um, and, and it's because of what I said, right? You have to rewrite, you have to replatform in order to truly recognize the value. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's great advice. Um, Scott is asking, uh, did I hear you say that you have similar carrier neutral capabilities like Equinix so that I can connect through Flux Central to any public cloud platform or multiple? Yes, ab absolutely. So um, one of the slides there, you know, showed a, a map and so, we, we've built a nationwide backbone across and between our 40 data centers. It's, it's owned and operated by us, and it's privately managed. In addition to that, we have a number of cloud on-ramps in a number of those cities across the, the country. I think it's 13 is the current count right now. And so, you know, we have the ability to get you very quickly to the most and through the most efficient and, and redundant and performant path. A lot of options in terms of how we do that, and you know, obviously, it depends on each organization's needs. Which you know, which public cloud um, zones and environments and regions are you trying to get to? Um, but you know, that's where my team comes in to really help you work to to understand, you know, what are the things you need to connect to? Where are your primary applications going to be running? And if you're co-located with us, if you're in a private cloud with us, um, if you're if you're connecting through us. You know, we have the ability to design that with you guys to make sure that you're getting 
the, the right level of redundancy, the right level of latency and performance, and the right level of access uh, you need in a flexible manner to all of those, uh, you know, all the major cloud providers, including, including, a number of, including a number of SaaS providers as well. Oh, okay, interesting. And then probably the final question here we have time for, and that is uh, Sean's asking, uh, can you assist in w when it comes to uh, certification and compliance uh, type scenarios? I know a lot of companies struggle to, you know, become compliant in their on-premises infrastructure, it takes a lot. Uh, can Flux Central make that easier? It, absolutely. So, you know, I'll, I'll pick on a couple of industries, financial services and healthcare, because those are, you know, tend to be some of the more the more strictly regulated ones. But um, PCI and HIPAA and high trust are, are things that, you know, we are experts in. We have a, a team, you know, for, I'll use PCI as an example. Our team is a QSA. Um, which means that, you know, we have extensive experience in going through and auditing, um, designing, remediating, um, you know, we can render decisions on behalf of the credit card companies. It, it's, you know, it, it, we, we acquired a, that capability of probably four years, five years ago now um, through, uh, through an acquisition of, a, you know, a focused uh, company. And that is a huge part of what we do for customers, um, both from a design perspective, as well as from a, a you know, helping to build processes and, uh, and procedures internally, um, you know, vulnerability assessments, you know, regular pen testing, um, on and on and on. There's, there's a, a long list of things that we can help with in the security and compliance space. Excellent. All right. Well, it sounds like Flex Central could be a, a great solution to help a lot of companies out there uh, that are struggling with a, a wide variety of IT challenges. Uh, Craig, so thank you so much for being on the event today. No problem. Thanks for having me, and uh, stay safe, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Great presentation, Craig. Uh, but for more information on Flex Central, uh, visit flexcentral.com. Also, check out the handout that's available there for download in the Handouts tab. That is the hybrid IT, the what's, the why's, the how's, and more. Uh, looks like a great resource, so make sure you check that one out. And now it's time for our first Amazon $500 gift card prize. That is going to Gary Nickerson from Oklahoma. Congratulations, Gary Nickerson from Oklahoma. Two more gift cards still to give away on the event today, so make sure you stay tuned. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter on today's Ecocast. That is Mr. Alan Waters, Senior Solutions Marketing Manager at Nutanix. Alan, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Thanks for being on, Alan. Take it away. Okay. Thanks so much. And uh, congratulations, Gary. That's a, that's a nice uh, gift card to, uh, to be winning. But hello, everyone, um, and welcome to today's presentation. My name is Alan Waters. I'm a Solutions Marketing Manager uh, with Nutanix. And I have a specific focus on private and hybrid cloud solutions. And today, I'm going to be talking about building a private cloud solution. Um, but I'm also going to be touching on, um, you know, how the public cloud has to do with it and combining hybrid cloud. And, you know, really when you have or when you build that private cloud solution the right way and pick the right platform, you know, things, things get better. And things are a lot easier when you try and make the move down the road to a hybrid cloud. Um, and, and you're not creating more silos. So let's get into it. So here's a slide I've been showing, you know, for at least a couple months now. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure it's like many surveys that you've seen saying, you know, businesses need to keep up or they're going to be left behind. Um, you know, there's even that uh, Fortune 500 stat saying, you know, 9 out of 10 of the Fortune 500s are gone over the past 60 years because of market disruption and so forth. But when you look at the slide, it, I think it even means more today when you, when you look at the pandemic that's going on um, for the past 60 or 90 days. You know, many companies had to suddenly, you know, spin up 500 employees that, that needed to work from home. You know, can you spin up 500 desktops overnight? You know, was the infrastructure agile enough to do such a thing? Um, but really, IT can be a huge part of keeping the business thriving, you know, doing things quickly, you know, staying ahead of the competition. That's really what this slide's saying, right? And, and, and picking the right platform to help you do that um, can be key. 
so some of the some of the biggest bigger challenges, and I'm sure you know a lot of you have, have seen a lot of these before or heard it before. Um, that first top right one, you know, and this might have to do with kind of the legacy, you know, traditional SAN type of environment where you have compute separate and storage separate. Um, being, you know, having difficulty provisioning apps, um, you know, spinning things up quickly, um, keeping things compliant and security. We'll talk a little bit more about about that. Um, you know, deploying infrastructure. You know, are you having storage sit, you know, and being tested separately from compute, and, you know, things associated with the traditional SAN side. Um, unpredictable ops. Um, of course, there's never enough resources and there's never enough budget. So really some of the top IT challenges um, that you might be facing today. But what if you could, right? Um, what if you could do all these things and more, um, avoid the potential dead ends and deliver quantifiable, quantifiable results, um, you know, uh, every step of the way, roll out apps, apps faster, um, get insight from those apps, make it actionable. And of course, there's always security, staying compliant, always huge on the list. Um, and, and, and then there's the data. Uh, it's always your most important asset. It needs to be protected, and it needs to protect, be protected everywhere. Um, and then there's, there's having the cloud-like agility and scalability for all your apps and all your workloads. So, and, and that's why organizations love the public cloud, right? There's, there's a lot of reasons to love it. And the public cloud, cloud, uh, cloud uh, market is growing like crazy. You know, go up to one of the, the, the big providers, swipe your credit card, you get VMs in minutes, right? You get that one-click simplicity. You get all the metering. You know, you know what you're using. You get what you pay for. And, hey, you wake up in the morning and you suddenly have, you know, five new uh, features. You know, the, the, the infrastructure, you, you don't have to worry about it, and it's always getting better. So th there are lots of reasons why organizations, you know, love the public cloud. But, you know, on the other side, there's still plenty of reasons for private, right? Uh, the first biggie is uh, data gravity. You know, applications really have to go where the data is being generated. Um, when you have to move that data from where it's being generated, um, whether it's those, machine, you know, apps or machines or employees or customers, it gets expensive. Um, so, you know, w one thing to consider um, is kind of that data gravity side. Um, moving legacy apps, you know, you, you talk to some CIOs and it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm all cloud. I have to move all applications to the cloud. And you say, well, how many do you have? He's like, oh, I have 300 or 400 applications. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's going to be pretty hard um, and it's going to be pretty expensive. So, uh, you know, some of that has to do with moving some of those leg legacy applications. And if you can even do it, um, there's also regulatory concerns, GDPR, you know, do you know where that data is living? and so forth that might limit the use of public cloud. And of course, there's a loss of control, um, you know, the, in the inability to deploy some custom applications and protect them, um, and that security that kind of that public cloud might, might, might be saying. So, um, but then over on the right, and definitely not the, not the least uh, most important, there's the unpredictable costs, you know, getting data in, getting data out, the kind of the egress charges can't be overlooked, you know, what might be costing you, you know, a, a few thousand dollars, you know, when suddenly there's two million users on it, you know, it gets expensive um, if the data is not being handled right. So, well, I think it went to the next slide here. Um, so definitely some things to, to look at. But what's the answer, right? The only answer is uh, hybrid cloud. It combines the two, a little bit of private, a little bit of public if you need it. And it's really the best of both worlds, you know, all the compliance, performance, and security of on-prem. And then you get the agility, um, kind of that endless scale of uh, the public cloud. So, you know, it, it, the important piece is having seamless integration between the two and not creating more silos, um, and, and which, you know, I'm going to talk about more um, in a few seconds. And of course, you can't have a presentation without a good stat in it. Um, and of course, IDC says, or one of the surveys they did when they um, they interviewed uh, IT professionals that, hey, I, we agree. You know, hybrid cloud. You know, 85% agree that that's probably um, you know the most appropriate and the best model uh, moving forward because it does combine some of the on-prem with public. So how do you get there? Well, picking the right platform is, 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 is the start. Um, and when you pick the right one, it makes everything else easier. 
you know, unlike some complicated suites that usually need loads of professional services, you know, it should be easy. Um, you know, adding components should be easy. Getting it up and running quickly should be easy. Um, and, and on top of that, you need to be able to support every workload and application um, associated with it. And this is, uh, you know, th these are different components that are usually associated with, you know, setting up a private cloud. I'll, t I'll touch briefly on each one of these. But it all starts with, and it all needs to support the apps and workloads across the, the, the top, right, from end-user computing, VDI, all the databases, Oracle SQL, uh, business critical apps, SAP HANA, and so forth. You know, all the way over to you know general compute, dev, and test. You know your your platform and, and infrastructure needs to support those, and it starts there. Um, and then there's different components to look at, like storage consolidation, automation, business continuity, and network and cloud security, which I'll touch on briefly. But of course, those of us at Nutanix, we believe that you know the, the, the first big start is making the move from legacy three tier architecture, traditional SAN, over to HCI. You know, make that start. Um, Hyperconverge has all the advantages. Um, they were being talked about in the previous solution as well. You know, start small, scale over time, one click operation, unified management. Uh, again, you know, moving to HCI, it's a, it's a, it's a, you can do another hour presentation just on that alone. But there's a lot of benefits to it, right? The, the web scale type of architecture, um, intelligent foundation, uh, and of course the resiliency, the always on, um, being able to replicate data in small and just keeping that um, a hyper converged infrastructure always on, and of course um, being able to support. And that's where Nutanix got its start, right? I mean, we're one of the uh, uh, leaders in HCI. Um, I think it's been over 10 years now, um, but we were we were one of the um, the leaders and one of the one of the ones one of the organizations to start the whole HCI um, environments and, uh, and and platforms. So we were the first ones, or one of the first ones. You gotta be careful. So what's next? As you move up the stack here, I call it my my layered cake. But one thing to look at is consolidating storage, right? When you look at all the data that's being you know, generated by your customers, all the employees, systems, and so forth, a lot of times it's overwhelming. Um, there's lots of different types. There's file, there's object, there's block, and there's a lot of vendors out there that, hey, you, you, you're going to need a different array for each one of those, right? And you're going to have an array over there for block, you're going to have an array over there for file. You know, you're just making more silos. And Nutanix can, en enables you to consolidate all of that, consolidate all of that wide variety of data, all the databases, all the files, and all the objects um, upon a single platform so that it scales non disruptively um, as your data grows. So consolidating it all onto a single platform, and more importantly, an HCI platform. Next piece is automation. Um, you know, machine, uh, machine learning, all the automation, you know, all through a single web interface, make it easy, reduce all those complex tasks, all those repetitive tasks, you know, from the lifecycle management, um, self-service portals, you know, add that on there so, so developers and engineers can come in and get their VMs on their own without the 200 steps behind it. So the, the automation is a big piece of, of, um, of building out a, a private cloud. Another piece along with this is, um, is seeing what's going on, right? How much is a uh, virtual machine costing the organization? Being able to show the chargebacks, um, you know, how, how much is a, a department using um, showing them what they're using, who's using what. But this is a big piece of being a, kind of a cloud operator and being able to show um, what all the different departments are using and being able to uh, show it back to the different businesses. So along with the automation, the cloud cost metering and showing what's being used on the different clouds is another big piece to look at. And of course, there's a business continuity, disaster recovery, um, each application uh, has availability requirements. You need a comprehensive approach to do this, you know, through resiliency at, at every level to make sure um, that all those workloads um, are always on, right? From the data center up to the cloud, um, you need a highly available, um, you know, self-healing solution that delivers the right SLAs for each of your applications. Doesn't matter what they are, um, you know, uh, but, but without the overhead of managing all the discrepancies 
transparent data protection solutions. And, 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 and we, you know, we look at it in three different areas, from the apps to the, um, uh, you know, synchronous and asynchronous replication or third-party vendors that we integrate uh, with. Uh, so Nutanix has lots of different options for you here, too. And, of course, last but not least is the network um, security, right, compliance. And we like to break this down into three different areas. There's the whole platform side of it, kind of the core pieces of it, um, all the way to the application side of it, and then the multi-cloud side of it. So you got to be able to have built-in capabilities for um, uh, encryption for data at rest. You need to have, on the application side, micro-segmentation um, to separate those apps um, in the network and the data that touches it all to keep it all secure. Um, and then on the multi-cloud side of it, um, it all has to be automated uh, with strong security controls um, to make sure that the cloud, whether it's private or on the public side, is all protected. So these, these are the different components. To think. And again, th this is where you're building out. And, and organizations, and you know, when, when I'm talking to um, uh, you know, customers in the briefing center, they'll say, well, you know, I have hyperconverged, or I have my own private cloud. And when you start digging into it, um, and you start asking them, you know, do you have the automation, or, or do you have a self-service portal? And you, and you start asking them uh, about different components about building out a private cloud. You know, there, there can be some, if you, if you just have some, um, uh, some storage over here on the right, you know, do you have automation along with that? Do you have self-service? Or, or, and this is even when you look at hyperconverged. There's a lot of customers that have HCI, but they don't have a lot of pieces added on top of it. And these are the different pieces that can help um, really build that private cloud um, uh, to, to, to the fullest. So you have all it. And you don't have to do it all at once, right? Pick your big, biggest challenges. And, and add on the different pieces, but, but again, being able to add the pieces on when you need it and having them quickly um, when you need it is key with Nutanix because we make it all easy. But what's the next step? After you build out your private cloud, the next step is getting to hybrid and getting to public. And the great thing that Nutanix does about it is we have license portability. You know, whether a cluster is running on-prem or it's running in the, cloud, in the cloud, it shouldn't matter, right? There should be no cloud lock-in. There's got to be native integration. There's got to be seamless movement between the cloud. You know, if, if a workload is better um, in the cloud, move it up there, right? Move this cluster from on-prem, move it up to the cloud um, using a single platform with the same um, uh, skill sets and the same management platform that you use to on-prem um, that you get to with public cloud. And, and these are the different pieces that make a true hybrid cloud platform. It has to be seamless. Um, and it has to be easy. And that's what the Nutanix clusters does. When you build out your private cloud platform um, and you add clusters to it, it builds it all together and it builds out that hybrid cloud. So it becomes a true thing. It, it, you combine public, you combine private for that hybrid cloud, and it's all together, one seamless control plane between the two. And Nutanix can deliver this. Um, from the bottom, from we, we, we'd love you to start with HCI, right? That's the start. That's, that's, that's where we believe um, you, you start that transition and modernizing all the way up to network and security and the different pieces. And then, say, 30, 60, six months down the road, if, if your customer success group comes to you or your sales group comes to you and says, hey, um, I have an application I would like to roll out. It's going to need to support 2 million customers, and it's going to be seasonable, right? Um, that's an application that might be better off running in a public cloud, and that's what Nutanix offers you, the ability to extend that application and run that on the public cloud if it grows out um, and it, it gets huge and it's going to be a seasonable type of application. And that's the type of platform that Nutanix offers from private all the way up to public to give you that um, hybrid cloud platform. So that's my uh, presentation. I know I went through a whole lot quickly, but I think I was uh, one minute over. Um, and I'm uh, happy to take questions if there are any questions. I'm trying to keep an eye on the folder over here on the left um, for questions. Yeah, great presentation, Alan. Thank you so much. Let's see, we do have some 
uh, questions here coming in for you from the audience. So the first question I wanted to ask you, and I want to call everyone's attention in the audience to the poll that I just brought up on the screen. Um, first question that I wanted to ask you is about uh, is having an HCI environment the same as a is it the same as a private cloud? Yeah, I, I, I did touch on this a, a little bit where um, I, and even for Nutanix, right? We have we have um, you know thousands and thousands of customers that have made the move to HCI. Um, but but do you have all the different components? Because when I think of a private cloud, I think of all the capabilities that you might get when you go up to a public cloud and you swipe your credit card, right? You have that portal. You can order stuff. It's all the automation that's hidden. You don't know where that storage is, is being, you know, is located. It's all the automation that, that happens on the back end. You can have all those same capabilities, you know, within your private cloud. Um, and a lot of those capabilities were kind of, and I call it the layer cake, were, were the different pieces that I talked about as you move along from automation um, to self-service and so forth um, uh, as you start to build it out. So, so it's kind of a yes and no. Um, HCI, in, in my opinion, is the start of that modernization. Um, but then being, a, you know, looking at, you know, when my engineers need a VM, you know, how many steps? Is that a 200-step process to get that VM rolled out to them? Or do you go to a self-service portal, have a one-button-click environment where they get it, and 10 minutes later, you know, it, it appears for them? It's, it's all that automation that gets built into it, self-service and the cost and the metering. So there are different components. And, and again, like I said, you don't have to add all those components at once but having a platform um, that enables you to get those capabilities quickly um, rather than months and months of professional services, I think um, is a key thing to think about. Okay, okay, great point. And kind of along the same lines, uh, Mitchell's question here is, uh, why Nutanix over other HCI solutions? Yeah, and I, I talked a little bit about this um, previously. You know, Nutanix is one of the, um, kind of the, the, the leaders in the industry. Um, we have a, a, a net promoter score of 90 plus, so customers love us. Um, I think if you look at some of the other vendors, you know, they're happy to be in the 60 um, NPS range. Uh, I think that's huge. We stress simplicity. We stress ease of management, um, life cycle management, um, adding things on easily, getting things done quickly. I think some of those are, are big capabilities that Nutanix offers over some of the other vendors that are out there, and even some of you know the, the lead vendors that's out there. Um, and don't don't forget about the um, the business continuity and resiliency, right? Look at look at the storage software side of it. Um, you know, being able to chunk data out and making sure that data is resilient is resilient in case something happens, um, and needs to be able to recover from. Um, you know, a challenge some like that, and, and and take a look at the storage software that your HCI environment is running on, um, because that can be another important factor. Okay, okay, well put, well put. Let's see another question they're asking: uh, Does Nutanix have a private, or ha does Nutanix have a public cloud, and um, or does Nutanix interface with other existing public clouds? How does that work? Yeah, good question. Um, so I mentioned a product called Clusters, um, where, you, where you have the option to run either clusters on-prem or those workloads in the public cloud. So um, right now we have the, uh, a relationship with AWS, so you'll be able to run those clusters on AWS um, and have that uh, movement back and forth between on-prem and AWS. And additional um, you know, public providers are on the roadmap in, within this year. Um, so we're getting there. Okay. But 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 initially it is the big it is AWS to start with. Okay. Nice. And then next question. Um, the industry says that public cloud is the way of the future. Uh, private cloud seems like the opposite of that. What's your take? <laughs> yeah, and, and hopefully I I kind of I kind of answered that throughout my presentation. Um, we, I mean, I believe, and I think most IT professionals believe, it, it's got to be a combo of the two, right? 
Um, there, there are certain workloads that run great in the public cloud, and there might be some that run great um, on-prem, but it all starts with the workload, and you've got to take a look at those. If, if you have all workloads um, that, are, that are great for a public cloud, sure, um, run, them on, run them on public cloud. Um, but we found, I mean, when I spoke to a customer um, around the turn of the holidays, they were bought, it was a smaller medical organization, uh, and I'm just, I'm giving a quick a customer example here, where the holding company that bought them had a go public um, initiative, right? So all, all their companies that they held had to go public. But when they did an analysis between running their applications um, on-prem versus public, um, running them on-prem actually saved them $3 million over five years. Um, because they're a consistent type of application and not a bursty, you know, um, seasonable type of application. So, so you really, it really comes down to looking at those, um, you know, what kind of security are you happy with, um, you know, the, and the storage, you know, where that storage lives. So, so it's a little of both. Um, you got to look at your workloads, um, but there are plenty of examples where on-prem might make better sense. Um, but, but then again, we, we allow you to have access to AWS or public clouds, right? So, so pick that platform that allows a little of both if needed. Okay. Okay. Yeah, great advice. Let's see. Another question here. Um, does having private cloud mean I won't have access to public or hybrid? I think you answered that, right? You said um, you – you work with AWS, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, All right. yeah. And, and others. It's not just so. So we we yeah. have the other big ones in in on the roadmap. So it's AWS to start. Um, but when you have the right public cloud, and and some you know some, some you know there are vendors out there that'll set you up with a private cloud, and then like the example I used earlier, um, if if say sales comes to you, comes to you with a new application that needs to run on the public because because of the amount of users and what have you. Are you going to set up another silo, like a group over here to run that environment, and then another group over here to run your on-prem stuff? You know, pick that platform that makes it all one, right? It's a seamless um, hybrid cloud platform that runs on-prem, but also can can run um, apps on the public side. So, um, just just look at both of those. Okay, great advice. So, what should people do to get started with Nutanix? What's your recommendation? So we do have, I, I did put a, um, um, a nice uh, design guide in the handout if you want to download that. But if you don't have time to read that, I would visit Nutanix.com, and on the top right, there's a test drive. So you can, you can actually try it out for yourself. I believe it's a 60 or 90-day test drive where you can actually see how easy Nutanix is um, and, and, uh, and, and see all the capabilities and see the simplicity that's behind it. So if you don't have time to read, to read, <laughs> to read the design guide that I placed in the handout section, go to uh, Nutanix.com and, and try the test drive. So it's, it's, it's incredible. And you'll see how easy it, is, it all is. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the event today, Alan. Great. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. And stay safe. Thank you. And thank you to Nutanix for supporting today's event. Again, make sure you download that design guide that Alan has available there in the handouts tab. And of course, visit Nutanix.com to give the solution a try for yourself. And with that, I'm excited to introduce our next presenters on today's EcoCast. I'm excited to welcome Shilpi Srivastava, Director of Product Marketing at Pure Storage, and Mr. Vaughn Stewart, Vice President of Technology at Pure Storage. Shilpi, take it away. Thank you, David. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this session. I'm Shilpi Srivastava, Director of Cloud Solutions Marketing at Pure Storage. And today, I'm joined by Vaughn Stewart, VP Technology and Alliances Par Partners. In the next 20 minutes, we'll talk about the latest virtualization trends and touch upon tools and technologies that can help you optimize resources to support your virtualization uh, workloads, whether that's in your private cloud or your hybrid cloud deployment. But before we get there, a quick intro for those of you not so familiar with Pure Storage. Hey, Juan, can you tell us a little bit about Pure Storage? Absolutely, Shilpi. Hey, thanks for inviting me in to be part of this presentation. Uh, just a bit of background for some of you who maybe come from a more um, virtualized cloud or containerized perspective. I want to just introduce you to Pure Storage briefly. Uh, we've been 
around for 10 years. We have uh, went public in 2015, so we're no longer just a startup storage company. We participate in a $50 billion uh, total addressable market. We've got over 7,500 customers. And most importantly, we have been rated in the upper right magic quadrant for Gartner for six straight years. Uh, that is the magic quadrant for enterprise storage. And note that we only sell storage that's either all flash or based in the cloud. So it's a, it's, it's a high mark for uh, a, a relative, um, relatively young storage company as well as our net promoter score, which is a survey of our customers, whether they would recommend our technology. Our net promoter score is higher than the four storage vendors that are uh, larger than us in terms of market share. It's higher than their net promoter scores combined in aggregate. So I share that with you that whether it's an analyst report, whether it's our net promoter score, uh, it's basically those are two forms of external validation about what we've been able to bring to market and drive our growth as a leading storage company. So with that, Shilpi, take it, take it over and let's talk about containers. Yeah, thanks for that one. And let's jump right in. As a lot of us know, a majority of enterprises today have or plan to have a hybrid or multi-cloud deployment. And this has been a major driver in the shift we are seeing in application architectures uh, from the more monolithic applications and virtualization uh, or VM-based applications to modern virtualization technologies and cloud native application architectures. About 10 years ago, we saw a massive shift from monolithic applications to VM-based application environments. And now with containers and Kubernetes, uh, the whole cloud native space and microservices-based architectures have become super attractive because of the lightweightedness and the easy portability that containers offer. And of course, orchestration tools like Kubernetes ha have further helped adoption of uh, these technologies. But note that containers were initially built with stateless applications in mind. And now businesses are looking to take advantage of containers for stateful applications as well, like their databases, analytics tools, and CI/CD pipelines. Now the challenges arise when we move, uh, when we use containers for stateful applications. And there are two key challenges that at Pure we started to look into. Firstly, traditional sto storage provisioning can be slow, and that really negates the advantage of fast deployment speeds for containers. And secondly, your container application environments can scale very quickly, and demands from infrastructure are dynamic in nature. So you really need your storage to be easy and economic to scale to support these dynamic needs. So container applications uh, basically want to consume storage as a service and integrate seamlessly with orchestration tools like Kubernetes for easy persistent storage provisioning. Look for storage that scales elastically across multiple protocols, block and file, to support the dynamic nature of these application architectures. And plus, future-proof your storage investment with a flexible, consumption model that unifies on-premises and cloud consumption under a single license so that you can start and de develop your applications in one place and move them around and deploy them anywhere as you grow your environment. At Pure, we kept these few capabilities in mind and uh, we introduced a couple of years ago, Pure Service Orchestrator. Now, Pure Service Orchestrator is basically uh, a software layer that functions as the control plane virtualization uh, layer that abstracts uh, your storage uh, environment to your Kubernetes environment. It, it integrates seamlessly with container orchestration frame frameworks like Docker Swarm, uh, D2IQ, Mesosphere environments, and Kubernetes, which has become the most popular one. The goal is to simplify persistent storage delivery for containerized applications. The other cool thing about uh, Pure Service Orchestrator, uh, apart from the automated storage delivery um, in real time, is that it pools multiple block-based and file-based storage arrays under a single deployment. Now this allows it to, in, to do an intelligent volume placement across your hybrid cloud storage fleet. 
it pulls together flash array and flash blade on premises, which is pure block and file storage arrays, uh, to provision across a multi protocol fleet. And it also provides easy data and application portability to AWS or Azure environments where you would have cloud block store, uh, pure storage cloud block store installed uh, by provisioning a seamless unified data plane across your hybrid cloud. The other thing when we spoke about uh, the requirements for container environments is that, uh, you know, not, not only does your storage provisioning need to be fast and your storage needs to scale, but also the consumption model really matters. Because of dynamic usage patterns that we see in container environments, you might need to scale up and scale down your storage and you don't want to pay for uh, burst scenarios or, you know, once in a while scenarios. You want storage license to be flexible enough so that you can scale it up and scale it down as needed, consume that storage on premises or in the cloud as needed. Needed, And so we have at Pure something called Pure as a Service, which is a unified hybrid cloud subscription model, a single license for all the storage that you could consume on premises or in public cloud when you're using Cloud Block Store for AWS or Cloud Block Store for Azure, which is in beta today. That was a quick intro into cloud, uh, into pure service orchestrator. And I want to quickly show you how the intelligent placement across uh, this multi protocol storage pool works. Now, pure service orchestrator, as I mentioned, it, it talks, it integrates seamlessly with your Kubernetes um, orchestration layer. So it constantly talks to your Kubernetes master. Uh, to see if your container application has made a persistent volume claim. Every time there is a persistent volume claim coming in from Kubernetes, Pure Service Orchestrator will quickly look at all of your storage um, to figure out how your arrays are doing on performance, on capacity utilization, and the health of the array to pick the best suited array and minimize any failed uh, provisioning attempts. You can also set policy tags uh, for, uh, you know, in case you have certain arrays that are assigned for certain applications, uh, you can always do that uh, within the Pure Service Orchestrator itself. And when you move your application from a flash array environment, for example, to an AWS or a Azure based uh, deployment infrastructure, you use the exact same storage scripts. Uh, there is no need to re-architect your storage scripts or your YAML files. That really gives you a very easy way to, um, to migrate these applications to or from different cloud environments. And, and lastly, I just wanted to quickly, before we get into the next section, uh, we have really made sure that Pure Service Orchestrator works with whatever platform as a service environment, uh, container as a service environment, or uh, orchestration tool that you would need, uh, that you would want to use. So we've provided integrations across the board with Red Hat OpenShift, with various different Kubernetes platforms, uh, Rancher for container as a service, and of course VMware, with which um, you know, we've been partners for a very long time. There's a lot of new stuff going on in the VMware virtualization space as well. And Vaughn, you're super close to this. Can you talk us through what's new and what's going on with VMware? Yeah, I, I would love to. Um, thank you for the update on Pure Storage Orchestrator. I find uh, what we're doing in that space to really just be um, um, quite, quite uh, amazing uh, and powerful in terms of going beyond just providing persistent storage to containers, going through the placement, uh, the, the, the flexibility of protocol, uh, the orchestration of, uh, of provisioning and deprovisioning. Folks, what I want to share with you today um, during the next um, nine and a half minutes that we have is I want to talk to you about VMware Cloud Foundation uh, on FlashNet converged infrastructure. Uh, if you're not familiar with Cloud Foundation, it is um, VMware's single architecture that spans both your private uh, and the public cloud, allowing you to extend on a per workload domain basis uh, workloads uh, into a hybrid cloud model. It allows a consistent operations between on-prem and in the cloud. And um, from an infrastructure perspective, it's built on uh, VMware validated designs, which 
the Pure Storage Flash Array was the first SAN ever certified for a VVD back with VVD 4.1. And most importantly, it gives you a single pane of glass management for not just the VMware environment, whether we're talking about containers, virtual machines, workload domains, uh, uh, ESXi servers, but even down to the storage layer. And so uh, Pure Storage is, has launched uh, VCF for Flash Deck, our converged infrastructure offering. And I wanna talk to you a little bit around the value uh, that we bring to, to those types of deployments. So I've broken this up into kind of four primary talking points and two of them I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail um, just otherwise we'll, we're gonna run out of time. So classic uh, you know, a technical guy bringing too many slides. First off is when you put VCF on pure storage, we're gonna help you optimize your data center requirements. In other words, we're gonna help you reduce the amount of, of um, capital that you spend on the infrastructure. And so we do this by one, eliminating hardware silos uh, and the technical debt of having you know, um, uh, you know, underused hardware. Two, we're gonna help you uh, reduce the infrastructure spend uh, compared to uh, say an alternative like HCI platform. And this just is the natural byproduct of a disaggregated ar uh, architecture with the secret sauce of a pure storage flash array. And then three, we're gonna talk about our, our evergreen storage and pure as a uh, service uh, offerings, which both help you uh, reduce the cost uh, that's uh, around legacy um, storage systems. So from a silo perspective, what you need to know about VMware Cloud Foundation is that you build domains. You have a management domain, which today must run on vSAN, and you have this construct of uh, workload domains, and you see them here on this image. Uh, what most people don't realize is that your workload domains is a physical assignment of ESXi servers, and if you're using uh, HCI-based storage, it also um, binds that storage to that, silo, to that uh, workload domain. And, and long story short is workload domains become silos. By putting them on the pure storage flash array, what you have is you have storage that is optimally, uh, optimally configured for, for availability, performance, and cost-centric uh, workloads. This gives you the, the means now to have storage that's elastic in terms of its ability to uh, provision, deprovision, size, and resize. You get flexibility and the ability to be able to move uh, ESXi servers from one workload domain to the other without having to, to uh, rebalance any data. And ultimately what you get is um, uh, the ability to, to uh, not have to overspend or get any data or compute trapped in a silo, right? It's affordable, it's flexible, and it's elastic. Um, one of the things that, that come up the most when we talk to customers about running their uh, virtual environments on um, an all-flash storage array is customers go, oh, look, uh, all-flash is for performance. You know, I'm looking for some better support around uh, tier two and tier three workloads, right? So I'm looking, most customers start to look at then affordability, whether in the infrastructure or in the operations and management. Um, what, we, what we've put together is a TCO tool that helps customers understand that uh, when you size your VCF or just your generic v virtualization environment on um, a flash stack versus say an HCI alternative, you can reduce your spend by up to 25% on compute, 75% on storage, 50% on power, and 30% in terms of a reduction on um, uh, rack space. I'm oh, sorry, 50% less on rack space, 30% less on power. Sorry, I, I, uh, my bad there. Um, we, we're happy to go through this TCO tool with you. Just reach out to a pure storage uh, partner and uh, we'll help you walk through that. And uh, what's best about this is we use public size, size, um, sizing tools and pricing to come up with these comparisons. And obviously you can dial the variables within your data center. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with pure storage, uh, we promote having a subscription to innovation. Uh, we've had uh, seven generations of hardware that have been, uh, been um, enabled to let customers non-disruptively migrate from one to the other. Uh, all software upgrades are, are, are delivered from the cloud. They are non-disruptive and they don't even impact your performance. We provide two models that customers can, can uh, acquire our technology. One is a CapEx model where um, uh, evergreen storage comes into play, which means your maintenance renewals will always be flat. And when you update your maintenance, you'll get new controllers, as well as you won't repurchase any existing capacity or you can just go to a pure on-demand, pure as a service model and just pay for what you use. Uh, more details at purestorage.com. Sorry here, I know I'm going very fast, but uh, I do wanna share with you uh, uh, basically a quart, quart of information in a pint-sized timeframe. Uh, second value prop for pure storage with, um, or with VCF on pure storage flash array is fabric flexibility. 
If you look at VCF just on a HCI platform, you're going to notice that your choice is only Ethernet storage. Uh, with uh, FlashDeck, uh, you're able to leverage fiber channel or Ethernet storage fabrics. You'll have the flexibility to non-disruptively migrate or change from one fabric to the other based on your company's strategic direction uh, and or budget or you know whatever other drivers you have within your data center. And third is you receive an investment protection to support new storage protocols as they come online and be in terms of being supported in uh, VCF. So product, protocols like non-volatile memory expressed over fabric that can either run on fiber channel or ethernet or technologies like Vive Balls. So uh, again, a future proof and always um, advancing storage platform underneath your VCF. Third value prop is in the area of simplifying VCF management. Um, with VCF on pure storage, what you do receive is 100% support for the SDDC manager functionality with the flash array or third-party storage. So no, no feature drop compared to running it with VCF. Uh, but what you also gain is that you eliminate the requirements to either have to reduce data protection or evacuate and rehydrate data when you go through ESXi server maintenance um, windows, which is, you know, it's a terrible decision that to have to be, you know, pushed into or forced into as well as you're gonna replace the complexity and trade-offs that are associated with, with storage. And that's kind of always been the, the Achilles heel of storage. So uh, from, a, from a foundational under, uh, perspective, um, you should get to know SDDC Manager. This is the single pane of glass which in, within VCF that allows you to uh, provision workload domains, VMs, uh, containers, also manage your uh, VMware infrastructure as well as third-party storage. So one single pane of glass, takes you from day zero deployment through lifecycle management and provisioning and deprovisioning. From a storage perspective, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time here. The flash array from pure storage, which is the uh, block storage in a flash stack, um, is the simplest storage uh, on the market. There are no trade-offs, no tunables. Basically, all you can provision is your authentication realms, volumes, and whether you're gonna add any data protection capabilities. No, no tunables means no trade-offs, which means better outcomes for you. A key slide that I'd like to focus more time on if I had it, but I don't, is that VC, uh, flash stack extends simplicity for VCF. I mentioned earlier, no data rehydration, no loss of data protection when you're doing any server maintenance or, um, uh, or any uh, software updates, firmware updates on your server side. A lot of folks don't understand that by having a disaggregated architecture, you can receive up to a 10x improvement in vSphere ESXi cluster management. So. Um, again, all I'm trying to do in this slide here is, is share with you some basic information and hope that you want to find more information on this because, frankly, in this webinar, it's, it's more about information sharing than it is uh, training at this point in time. So my last and final bullet point around running VCF on FlashDeck is that we, we add additional automation and protection to your VCF environment. First off, FlashDeck provides you a consistent, repeatable, orchestrated deployment of the hardware infrastructure that is FlashDeck underneath your VMware Cloud Foundation. We're gonna accelerate VM and container provisioning and cloning. Uh, we're gonna do automatic data placement, rich orchestration through our VASA provider, VAA integrations, storage policy-based management, vRealize um, automation, vRealize orchestration, et cetera, as well as we're gonna increase your availability and business continu con continuity through, uh, first off, flash, flash array uh, VM level snapshots, VMware SRM, and our active cluster with VMware Metro storage clustering. So these are our four value props here, which is uh, Cloud Foundation on Pure Storage will optimize your data center resources, provide fabric flexibility, simplify VCF management, and automate and protect your VCF environment. And so my last slide here, as we wrap up here, for more information on everything that Shilpi has shared with you, as well as what I've talked about, you can visit purestorage.com and join us on May 13th for our next webinar, which we're gonna talk about HCI or CI insights for an optimal and interoperable cloud. With that, I'm Vaughn Stewart. I was joined by Shilpi. Uh, Shilpi, do you want to say anything as we go? Thank you, Vaughn. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Great. Thanks. Open up for our questions. Yes, I'm still on the call. Excellent presentation, Vaughn and Shilpi. Thank you so much. Uh, let's do some Q&A now. And while we do that, I've just brought up this poll question for the audience. Uh, what additional information would you like about the pure storage solution? So uh, Vaughn, Shilpi, are you there? I'm on, yep. Hey. Awesome, thank you. So let's see, the first question that came in, they're asking, uh, does pure storage support vSphere with Kubernetes? 
Yeah, so uh, absolutely. We've been uh, working with uh, VMware on a bunch of their uh, Kubernetes integrations. Today, we are validated for VMware Enterprise PKS. And uh, we're working together with the team on day zero integrations with Tanzu and Project Pacific later this year. Okay, exciting stuff. Cool, cool new uh, innovative stuff on the horizon there. Um, next question. Uh, is Pure Cloud Block Store available on VMware Cloud on AWS? Um, so uh, we are integrated uh, with VMC uh, not as a native storage backend within uh, VMware Cloud for AWS. VMC, as a lot of you might know, has certain restrictions around uh, native uh, backend support. But our customers are able to connect uh, their VMC environments to Cloud Block Store for AWS via the guest iSCSI connections today. Okay. Yeah, so we, okay, we, nice. we, we find that Cloud Block Store in VMware Cloud uh, on AWS today um, is good for like certain use cases where you've got, you really want to make rapid copies of the data sets for a lot of test development type work, um, but it's not there today for like, you know, DR from on-prem to the cloud. but. Uh, we're working to try to remove those limitations, and we'll let you know when that happens. Okay, excellent. And then another question here, they said, in the VCF presentation, you said that pure storage flash arrays replace vSAN. Are there any interoperability issues there? Yeah, so um, one, I want to be one, clear. Two, on, on, yeah, yeah, I want to be clear in terms of, um, uh, you know, we work, we work uh, extensively with VMware, uh, particularly with, within VCF about, uh, enabling interoperability between vSAN and the flash array. And, you know, today with VMware Cloud Foundation, you know, you require vSAN for your management domain and you have choices then for your workload domains. And so hopefully um, what everybody took away is, is um, you know, using Pure as a workload domains gives you a set of capabilities that's just not found within um, the vSAN platform. And, you know, kudos to VMware for, for providing all of the standardized um, set of management management capabilities with an SDDC manager across both Flash Array and vSAN. So we're really proud of that. And from an interoperability standpoint, you know, this means customers can can pick, choose, and combine, mix and match between workload domains that are uh, vSAN and Flash Array, whether on-prem, remote remote office, in the cloud, etc. You can move workloads between them. Um, um, you know, uh, completely non-disruptive. You know, you can. Um, um, uh, I have a lot of interoperability from from that perspective. I should say sorry for the for the <laughs> ums and ahs there, but uh, yeah, it, you know you could. Um, I think a lot of people think you must have the same source and target uh, data construct if you're going to move workloads or do replication or do DR, and uh, that's that's not the case. You can, uh, you know, one of the benefits of VMware Software Defined is that you can have different hardware underneath the infrastructure. Yeah, great point. I didn't, I didn't actually realize that with VCS. So really cool stuff there. Um, next question they're asking about is the new uh, Pure Cloud Block Store. Is that available today? Yes, so Cloud Block Store for AWS is available today. So this is our software that runs on the um, AWS cloud, uh, making use of AWS resource, uh, backend storage resources. But then, yeah, you get all the capabilities of your um, software, the data efficiencies, the added reliability, predictable performance, all of that, you get it on AWS. Uh, we are uh, in beta with the Cloud Block Store for Azure. And so um, we have a bunch of beta customers trying it out, experimenting with it right now, and uh, we're expecting to go GA later this year. Awesome. Yeah, cool new stuff coming from Pure. And then, Next question, is Pure integrated with Google Anthos? So Pure is uh, integrated. Uh, we have partnered with uh, the Google Cloud platform um, through their storage ready initiative for Google Anthos. So yeah, if you're using um, the Google Cloud Cloud platform uh, Anthos initiative uh, for your hybrid cloud environment, uh, Pure's Flash Array and Flash Blade systems can be integrated uh, into your private cloud there uh, within Google Plat uh, Google Anthos uh, through our pure service orchestrator, orchestrator which is our um, software delivered through the CSI plugin. Okay, okay, nice. And then here's another question that just came in. Uh, Mitchell's asking uh, about, you know, price comparison 
Um, Vaughn, maybe you want to take this one. I mean, what has Pure done to make flash storage more affordable? So, uh, David, that's a great question. So, obviously, as a, the vendor that gets recognized as making flash mainstream, we lead the industry in terms of our data reduction technologies. We are anywhere from two to four times more storage efficient than alternative platforms. And, you know, it's not something that we market a lot now because we've, we've grown up, um, you know, we're, we're 10 years old now, and, you know, we're five years past IPO and, and going from private to public. But, um, uh, you know, you need to look at storage nowadays um, on a factible price per gig, right? And so that means what are your what are your data protection overheads? You know, what's your data reduction technology yield you? And you know, what are you paying for? Um, and so, you know, when we compete with HP and EMC, I assure you, there's there is aggressive price competition between Pure and those other vendors. Or if you're looking at HCI platforms, for example. Um, um, and so here's what I would say. If, if you're looking for someone that costs 10 cents on the dollar, that's not us. If you're looking for, uh, you know, enterprise class storage, that's at an enterprise class price point, that's going to, you know, be price competitive. Um, and for some customers, you know, can have a big, you know, um, price reduction. Others may be more common with their budget is. Um, that's where we play. Excellent. Well said. Uh, it looks like that's all the questions we have, but really great having you on. Thank you so much, Shilpi and Vaughn. Thanks a lot thank for you, having David. us, Dave. And thank you to Pure Storage for supporting the Ecocast today. Make sure that you check out the handout that's available there for download in your audience console. Uh, that's the, the IDC white paper on unified hybrid cloud uh, storage with Pure Green's new Evergreen Storage Service Program. And with that, it's time for our next gift card giveaway. We have another Amazon $500 gift card, and that's going out to Patrick bon Bonich, B-O-N-I-C-H, from Colorado. Congratulations, Patrick Bonich from Colorado. Uh, one more gift card to give away still on the event today, so make sure that you stay tuned for that. And now it's time for our next presentation on the event today. I'm excited to welcome Mr. Alphonse Michaels, Senior Product Marketing Manager at DataCore. Alphonse, are you there? Yes, I am. And um, hello and welcome also from my side. Thank you for being on, Alphonse. Take it away. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And in this brief presentation slot, I would like to briefly uh, talk about um, the optimization options um, users of virtual infrastructures have when they would leverage the ultimate flexibility of software-defined storage and, of course, what is meant by this term flexibility because it's a general term often used and um, that is also the background for the title you're going to see here, Evolve Your Virtual Infrastructure with Ultimate Storage Flexibility. And therefore, first I would like to take a look at a general overview. This is the starting point, a small virtualized infrastructure, and we will see it several times during the presentation, which contains some animations, even to visualize um, how software-defined storage operates. So we have here um, a couple of applications running in virtual machines. Nearly all are virtualized. There's just one exception in the middle. Let's say this is an old file or print server which hasn't been virtualized for reasons that there's a specific card in there or whatsoever. And of course, they leverage uh, central provided storage. This storage is in this case um, in a so-called HA configuration. So it does mean that this is a storage cluster or a mirrored pair of storage, the same type same stuff um, inside and this is let me say the starting configuration as said it's just an example it's a small configuration it also can have thousands of virtual machines and several storage systems underneath the principles do not change and this is um, let me say the foundation point but if you take a look at exactly this configuration i kindly ask uh, the audience to take a look whether there is if you compare it to your configuration on site, um, in terms of room for improvement, are you currently happy with uh, the capacity? And if not, what does it mean? How can we expand um, capacity um, in that environment? So is the supplier of that storage systems able to provide the drives you need? 
are they out of service already or um, if they're currently um, as we are going through um, a kind of recession enough budget available for that capacity to get this storage from that supplier you originally purchased the storage from what about accelerating performance what options do you have um, does this allow to have and this also is then the next point to integrate new technologies does mean for example flash drives as performance tier or is it possible to do aut um, some auto tiering between them or t even to integrate newer technologies for example um, even faster drives yeah all of these are questions um, which needs to be answered and the answer is not um, it's often not very simple. Also, what is a refresh of storage? So if it's out of service already, it's six or um, seven years old, and even the support is not provided. This would typically result in a full data migration, which causes a lot of trouble and downtime and also a very painful pro, um, process. And um, what about the DR capabilities? Uh, can the data be replicated to um, a third-party location? and so on and so forth. The same is due to data availability problems. These are all questions which um, you may ask yourself. And um, as these are marked as questions, this brings me to the David, um, if you can call in the poll, please. Um, which deficiencies of your storage environment are you most interested in addressing? So what would you like to get solved currently for your um, storage environment? Would you like to get uh, better performance out of it? Would you like to get um, better business continuity? So means uh, the availability increased, or do you plan um, an expansion or refresh of the storage or leverage new technologies, MVME Flash or Intel Octane or, or whatever technologies you think about when you um, uh, talk about uh, when you think about your storage, or one or the others. This is also slightly used um, in the later um, presentation to focus on one or the other point. So let's wait for the results. Yeah, I appreciate everyone's responses coming in here. Let's get just a few more, and then I'll share the results with you, and you can see how you stack up with your peers. All right, thank you everyone for those. Let me share the results now. And Alphonse, it looks like 31% said uh, performance, followed by uh, at roughly even tie between capacity and leveraging new technologies. What's your take on that? Yeah, that means for me uh, that um, I prepared my presentation correctly because um, this is one of um, the key points um, I'm uh, talking about, and I will also explain how this can be done in the same way. When I did the introduction, I already came to the point that increasing performance and adding new technologies, for example, MVME Flash or um, other technologies, is one of the key points. And yeah, this makes me um, or motivates me to move forward. All right. Um, but before we go um, that far, I would like to give you a brief introduction into Sun Symphony, which is block-based software-defined storage, just an overview to understand its principles, how it is implemented as virtualization layer between the applications and the storage systems you will see afterwards, and also what can be made with that. Of course, the consumers can be any user or any application running or accessing it via physical servers, virtual machines, and also containers. We have plugins, especially for uh, containers. The access method with block storage is very clear. It's typically fiber channel and iSCSI. Sun Symphony as unified storage system also has an, um, offers NFS and SMP support. But the recommended way, um, of course, when it came to hyper, uh, for a virtualized environment, is fiber channel and iSCSI. Then it has um, a lot of options in operating and insights, of course, storage provisioning. Then data migration, this is a very important capability because it allows you to do many changes during operation. We will see that later on. Of course, any kind of charts and also proactive alerts does mean that we do have predictive analytics with proactive alerts that um, advise you uh, to do some changes before a problem occurs and, of course, orchestration. 
Then on the integration and management side, we have command and control with a full RESTful API, so it can be integrated in any management tool. You can leverage um, uh, the own console, of course, but also uh, PowerShell and CND lets. Then we have um, many, many plugins, especially in terms um, of providing, for example, persistent storage to uh, stateless containers, a Kubernetes plugin. Then mentioned in a virtualized environment, we have um, a VM plugin for backup solution. And also uh, worth to be mentioned, especially for VMware environments, we do have a VASA integration that allows us um, to uh, support um, um, stor uh, policy-based storage management, means directly um, managing us through um, the VMware profiles associated with that. Storage, which can be connected, this is shown in the protocols, is of course MVME, fiber channel, iSCSI, any SAS or SATA connection, and of course uh, the cloud gateways provided by the cloud providers. So any kind of storage can be leveraged. And the heart in the middle, these are the so-called storage or data services. These are the services which are provided regardless what storage is underneath. And this is a, a very important point. And also regardless which uh, types of storage are underneath. So we enable auto tiering, we will see that later on, between different kinds of storages, uh, different kinds of storage systems. As caching, we use um, also um, the fastest, um, let me say, uh, memory, which is the main memory of the computers. Then we have a nice feature, continuous data protection. It's an ideal um, addition to a backup and snapshot policy um, because it's uh, um, con continuously locks or writes. So in the case of a disaster, when you have to go back to the last good data status, it allows you to have an RPO and RTO of zero. Um, then, of course, deduplication and compression, encryption, load balancing, parallel I.O. is something I need to mention because it's the prioritization of um, serial processes. This is a patented technology we use here. Then we have quality of services. We um, work with limitations in this case. A random write accelerator, as the name says, it turns random writes, uh, um, random writes and sequential writes, which makes it faster. So it's also for tuning um, performance, like caching and parallel IO is. Then replication and site recovery. This is asynchronous replication to a remote site including um, auto failover, auto resynchronization, possibility to test any failover scenario, and of course um, also an auto fail back. Then snapshot storage pooling, this is the essential thing we do. Different types of storage will be pooled and be treated as ones. Then synchronous mirroring, but it's not only synchronous mirroring, which is typically a rate one. It's also that this is a so-called grid. Does mean if one side fails, the other one is always up and running. So without interruption for the users, it continues. And then some provisioning that it's uh, that we do not, um, let me say, block the allocated space, we only block the really used space. This is just a brief overview on the capabilities um, of software-defined storage, but let's have a look to the um, nice things you can do with that. First of all, the introduction of SDS. So you remember that picture. Um, I don't need to explain again. And to insert software-defined storage, it's a very simple manner. It's just um, inserting it as it is a software, either as properly sized server or as properly sized virtual machine. Properly sized in this terms is not necessarily um, driven to the CPU requirements or, RAM, um, or memory requirements. They are not that high, except you have large amounts of data and you would leverage the cache. Of course, then RAM becomes a number. But it has also to do with connectivity. As you can imagine, this is a small configuration here. Virtual machine um, does make sense. But if you just think about 20 storage system underneath, in terms of connection, it would be good to have directly attached cards. So it um, does also make sense in this case to think about um, a physical server as um, location for the SDS layer. Um, what will be used in this way, the service will be set up. This is a preparation. All the things will be brought together. And then there is just a very tiny thing which needs to be to, uh, done because you still have the applications accessing um, the storage directly. But to introduce SDS, this connection has to be broken. 
and it has to be reconnected through the SDS system. Um, we are working with path through disk so that the content directly is readable for us. And at the end of the day, it does mean a 10 minutes downtime because this is the reconnection of all the applications and all the users from the path they already know to, directly to the storage, then to us, and we taking care of the connection to the physical attached storage. This with the 10 minutes, of course, is depending on how many connections you have. If you have thousands of connections, of course, it will take a little bit longer. If you have just uh, these, I would guess it's something about 20 connections, this can be done uh, in less than 10 minutes. And as said, it could be done at any time. It just needs some preparation. And then the SDS layer is brought in there. More interestingly than the very simple migrate in is that you directly have all the features we have discussed earlier. Just remember uh, the caching or the auto tiering, or even that you can do um, remote replication to a third location or even to a destination in the cloud. These services are already there and they can be leveraged. And now, as I've seen, that performance and integration of new technology is one of the key uh, things. Here an example how to accelerate application performance with MVME Flash. Because assuming that these are older storage systems, um, possibly there is no option to integrate them directly in the storage systems. Now, there is also something what we call the 10... 90 rule. This 1090 rule does mean that only a minor portion of your data cross the major portion of your IOs. In terms of the 1090 rule, this says just 10% of your data cross 90% of the IOs. So would mean, if you take a look at that, if you can ensure that always these data who require this high IO are on very fast MVME flash, that would be great because then you do not need an all flash storage. Then you can continue with your existing storage by having the full performance out of it. And this is exactly where this uh, brief um, demonstration is about because when you insert the um, SDS layer, of course, and if you decide for physical servers, then you can directly build in some MVME flash into those servers. And even if you do it later and you have um, it installed as physical servers, just use hot plug NVMe U.2 drives and they can be inserted during operation. What then happens is that the auto tiering layer takes care that the most access data will be automatically brought up exactly to this layer. Of course, this is just a moment in time topic and as auto tearing typically does, you know it from other storage systems as well, over the time, the data change. And when they change, they will be brought up to the slower storage again. And this is a continuous process which dynamically happens in the background to ensure that at any time when you have uh, important data which needs to be accessed are brought to the fastest storage layer. And the applications on top do even only recognize that they have fast access to the data, but they do not recognize what happens in the background and that um, at one point in time, um, their uh, files are on um, the flash storage and in another point in time when they are rarely accessed, they are back in the old storage systems. This is just one example how you can integrate new technologies and um, also speed up um, your storage in addition to what the cache is, um, is enabling, which is, of course, in the SDS servers, what parallel I.O. is increasing in performance and what the random write accelerator is increasing in performance. So these are all add-ons which um, give a, a tremendous performance boost even for the existing environments um, you have and uh, um, the, let me say, old storage you use. A further example, it was not so much in the interest, of, therefore I go further uh, quick around it, but it's just the simple way how to expand and refresh existing capacity with nearly any storage. And any storage means any type of storage, any brand, so anything which speaks uh, fiber channel or iSCSI. And in this example, I'm just um, adding two storage systems to double the capacity from a totally different vendor with a totally different disk types in there, possibly here already um, uh, partly brought in uh, flash because the auto tiering you have seen, we can, up, uh, can handle up to 15 tiers, which allows us to have a broad variety on different types of flash disk and of course also on spinning disk. Um, so um, there is no limit. 
and you can use it as additional resource. Again, the applications on top do not even recognize that you have new ones. And if you would like to replace the storage systems underneath because they are too old, it's uh, also a very simple process. This will be done um, in the background. The data are copied regardless of source or destination between them. Again, the applications will not even recognize this. If you now say, yes, in a virtualized environment, we do have um, storage remotion or storage live migration, this can do the same. Uh, in principle, uh, fully agree to that. But please keep in mind that then the, um, the servers where the applications run take care of copying the data. In such an environment with uh, just a few applications, I think the maximum is eight VMs on one server, this shouldn't be such a big problem. But if you think of la uh, larger environments, if you would like to migrate the entire data set from one to another, um, this has um, really um, measurable impact in terms of response, uh, response times of the applications running on these servers. And in this case, this migration can be done really in the background, fully transparent. And once the migration is done, the old storage can be decommissioned, used for other things. So it's very simple to expand and also to refresh that storage. Continuing this example, here, a quick run through. This is still the configuration, but what about SDS and hyperconverged? Hyperconverged using cheap components from um, servers is very interesting. Servers can have directly integrated NVMe uh, disk, which is a cool thing. And now, in a very quick manner, how to get there from a classical storage design into a hyperconverged during operation without violating any SLAs. Of course, first step is you need to um, virtualize this one physical server. Once that is virtualized, you take a new server or that server, equip it with enough storage capacity because you would like to go hyperconverged, so you use either built-in disk or directly attached disk and uh, build up a third mirror, which is capable with SDS without any problem. So you have three copies of the data. So if you would now isolate one of the other systems, that means um, that still two copies of the data are available in the storage system and in your new hyperconverged systems, and all the applications on top will be served that way. Now you equip it as well with sufficient integrated um, disk. These are just examples. There is no mandatory need to have this amount of spinning disk and this amount of flash. You can go all flash. You can go all spinning disk as, as your business determines. And then, of course, you also bring it back to the mirror. It will be synchronized in the background. Just move the virtual machine to it. And the same process then for the last one. We still have two copies of the data. The applications on top will be served. Excellent. Two are already run in your hyperconverged environment. And once um, the uh, third server is exchanged or equipped appropriately, then um, you bring it back to the configuration. And what now starts, it's um, um, a funny animation. It's at least a long track. With live migration, the data are already there. You move the virtual machines and you distribute them to your new hyperconverged environment. And once this is done, what you have, you have a fully hyperconverged environment. The old servers can be decommissioned. You can do whatever you want with them. You can resell them. But what we have achieved in this brief and tiny process is not only hyperconverged. What achieved is hyperconverged flex, and this shows the flexibility because this is a hyperconverged environment which can serve its storage to external servers. And it's not only an iSCSI target. These external servers can also be uh, uh, proprietary Unix systems, uh, which only can talk fiber channel. Of course, it needs that you have brought the fiber channel card into the hyperconverged server. But once they are there, you can serve the storage provided by these systems to any other server um, via fiber channel or iSCSI. And moreover, you can leverage any um, storage provided through the access methods, does mean iSCSI, fiber channels, SAS, SATA, um, which is externally, also portions. And if you find out that hyperconverged is not the right solution for you, you can also return to classic. So this is not a one-way trick. You can go up and down. And this is meant by um, the flexibility of hyperconverged. So if we now take a brief look
on um, the possible room for improvement and expand capacity. It can be said it's very simple with software-defined storage. Just add whatever is there. So any budget um, um, slowdowns right now you can possibly encompass by using cheaper storage. Yeah, accelerate performance. Uh, we showed that how this can be done. Several integrated technologies in the software-defined storage layer already, and the simple way of integrate new technologies, which then can fully be leveraged for the entire storage. Also, a storage refresh is can be done during operation, and uh, you can refresh uh, with any brand to any brand. Then um, built in the R capabilities are integrated with automated failover and uh, resynchronization and failback capabilities. So to overcome any data availability problems, that means that all of that is achieved without disrupting your business operations does mean that you can do this during operation, getting everything modernized in your data center when the time allows it, when your budget allows it, and when you would like to do it during regular hours. This is important for the administrators. Just a brief um, introduction of the um, two offerings we have in Data Core Software Defined Storage. What we talked about recently is Sun Symphony for block storage. Um, it's uh, the mix of SAN, DAS, Flash, um, disk, and including the hyperconverged deployment, which is, has a focus on high availability and optimized performance and utilization. This especially is for block storage, because these are the requirements in block storage environments where also uh, databases fall under and um, high performance applications, whereby when you think about unstructured data, this is the area of file and object storage, we have a separate offering with Philo. It has similar functionalities, but not technically realized a little bit different because the requirements are a little bit different. Importance is also an important factor. Uh, uh, performance is also an important factor for uh, file and object storage, but not that important as it is for block storage. Here it is more how to get an overview about several separate NAS filers, so a NAS and file server pooling, that you have a unified global namespace so that it's easier for the users to find some files and to collaborate, but also for the administrator to define central routes, so on and so forth. And, of course, to leverage um, high-capacity storage, so offload capacities to cloud or object storage. And ideally, of course, um, uh, deduplicated uh, de and compressed. Yeah, this already brings me to the last slide, where we just um, have the call to action that you uh, can't ask you to evolve your infrastructure with software-defined storage. Here with um, our offering, especially for block storage, um, we just encourage you to leverage the power of Sun Symphony because it enables you to maximize the volume of your existing investments. It allows you to automate, the, automate uh, your data placement so that the data are there placed where you need them. And um, also, it enables you to modernize your data center without any dis um, disruption. By the way, these values are also true for vFilo in the special uh, requirements for unstructured data. And um, when um, I can only recommend that you possibly be just um, click on datacore.com, try it now. Here you can. Um, request an individual live demo where you see the products live and discuss your project one-on-one -on -one with our experts. Or you can attend the product tour. It's a brief webinar uh, with the option to ask individual questions after the brief webinar. Just get there or request a quote or request a contact. Um, this is the fastest way to get in touch with us so that you can experience the ultimate flexibility um, yourself. Yeah, this brings me to the end for the presentation so far. Thank you very much for your attention. Great presentation, Alphonse. Uh, really cool stuff. And I want to highlight to everyone that um, the handout, of course, in the audience console there for Data Core uh, is available uh, while we do some Q&A. So I'm going to bring up this poll that just says, what additional information would you like about the Data Core solution while we talk about the questions that came in? So um, Alphonse, first question I had for you here is uh, about the data core solution, and once they're saying, once you're controlling my storage, isn't your SDS layer the new dependency that I would have? Um, it's a good question. 
and I haven't explained that. And the answer directly is no. There is no um, um, dependency because when you remember the migrate in process, where it was simple and causes a 10 minute um, downtime, this is a reversible process. Does mean if, if a data core customer came to the conclusion, um, hmm, this is not the right solution for me, I, w I would like to go to another one. He simply uses the same way backwards. Does mean that uh, the again I mentioned that earlier the pass through disk. This is how we call them. Take a look at that. Um, then um, we uh, place the data on the pass through disk. Take care that all the data are available as pass through disk, and then only the reconnection has to be done from the application directly to what we call pass through disk. What in the end of the day is then the physical volume of the storage system, and that's it. At the end of the day, it's again a 10 minute downtime, but of course, depending how many connections you need to be reconnect. So it's um, a perfect solution, and we do have a couple of customers, um, especially in the past. They have uh, very proprietary um, Unix applications, and they use this just for data migration from a storage from vendor A to a storage from vendor B in a typically refreshed cycle, just to give you an example for that. Okay. Okay, excellent. Another question came in. They're asking about updates. All right. What happens when you need to update the data core solution? Um, you can run it as a so-called rolling update. So there is either the option to run directly, um, we call it maintenance mode, or even if you have a three, co um, a three copy installation. So if you have a three copy installation, it's out of question. I'm guessing that this question goes in the direction that if you update one node, that the high availability uh, gets lost. Um, and here we have a special maintenance mode which allows you to leverage either other data core service if you have them in the, um, in the environment to take care of the changes or to live with the risk that um, the data um, are not redundant in the time you're doing the update whereby only the reboot of the update is the critical time. Um, or as said, you leverage the maintenance mode which copies the data then or which leverages another data core node which takes care of the connection. Okay. Okay, very cool. And then there's another question here about is it possible to have a single pane of glass for management with data core if you have multiple nodes? Um, of course, and also the data are exchangeable between. We have um, especially a product. I mentioned the predictive analytics um, earlier today. Uh, we call it data core insight services. It's available with term licensing. And um, there you have a single pane of glass. You can also switch between different installations. doesn't mean between different locations, so you have an overview. Um, in terms of um, the management it's, um, itself, um, you then partly, depending on the exact setup, um, you need to uh, manage different groups separately. As I said, this depends on the setup, but you have a general overview and you have a general access through a single console. Nice. And then another question they're asking about essentially active versus inactive data. If you have 10% of the data that's you know highly active and 90% that's you know very low active or inactive, can Data Core help with that in some way? Ooh, uh, I don't know whether I get the question right because active data and inactive data we typically use um, with VFILO, especially for the unstructured data, and um, of course, we can help with that, um, as we can, um, for vFilo, we know exactly the pa access patterns. Also with um, Sun Symphony, we know the access patterns, and we can use leverage um, very cheap storage. It's also possible to migrate this to uh, different directions, because if you take a look at our licensing, we have also for Sun Symphony different license classes. It's enterprise, um, standard, and large-scale secondary, and as the name says, large-scale secondary. This has a limited feature set in terms of performance, but uh, has a very low price per capacity. This is the way how we license. And then these data can be brought to storage under the control of um, large-scale secondary licenses, which is not a problem, and of course, which then saves also license costs. Nice, nice. Hopefully yeah, so this answers answer the question. Yes, yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. like it could be very <laughs> helpful in that scenario. Uh, all right, well, it looks like that's all the time we have for questions, but if people wanted to get started with Data Core, um, looks like you had a, a URL here. I'll bring right back up on the screen. 
is that what you recommend people do to visit the where did it go oh right there uh, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> yeah uh, if possible yes please uh, this is a way a simplest way to, uh, to contact and uh, you also find case studies where you see a lot of um, other things um, um, where customers tell us um, how many hardware they exchanged, how many new technology introduced. So it's very interesting read. I just uh, try to get you there or just datacore.com. You will find the rest. We have tried no buttons on every page. Excellent. And I want to call out everyone's attention that URL that's on the screen is clickable. If you just mouse over it, you can click on that, yeah. and it will open a tab in your browser. All right. Well, great presentation. Thank you so much for being on the event today, Alphonse. Thank you very much for having me, and also thank you very much to the audience for listening. Absolutely. For more information, visit datacore.com slash try it now, or just datacore.com. Also check out the handout that's available there in the download section. And now it is time for our final presentation on today's event. I'm excited to welcome Cynthia Gutowski, Senior Product Marketing Manager at NetApp. Uh, also Chris Rodriguez, better known as C-Rod. Uh, who's a cloud solution principal architect and EUC product manager at NetApp as well. Cynthia, take it away. Hey, David, thanks for the introduction and thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Cindy Gutowski and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in our world with regards to BDI. And today, well, I guess I always refer to it as BC or before COVID, right? I know that working from home and having that flexibility has always been on my dream board. And in fact, before this all had happened, we had conducted surveys with, um, with employees around the world and discovered that 99% of employees wanted some flexibility or some work from home. However, it, it just wasn't quite feasible yet. We didn't have the collaboration tools we have today like Zoom and WebEx, and we didn't certainly didn't have the security measurements put in place, right? Think about VPN, that's one of the applications you immediately put into place with any remote work from home environment or e-learning to stop um, anybody from breaking into those important um, calls or gaining access to your data. And the way I see it is before we had one centralized access point, and now that we are doing work from home or remote environments on any device anywhere, we have just opened up Pandora's box for, for hackers. And in addition to that, businesses didn't have the infrastructure either. Um, we didn't have all of the bandwidth we need to accommodate all of this this multiple access points um, and all this data going back and forth, right? So our infrastructures weren't built. And the other thing is employees, employers didn't quite trust the employees. They didn't know if they would be taken advantage of. Were they going to get 100% of productivity out of their employers and were, or out of their employees? And so, you know, now we fast forward into COVID and we were mandated to put in place remote work environments. We are mandated to accommodate this remote world and provide our employees with the right tool set, the right collaborations. We had to trust them. We've had to accommodate infrastructures to support this remote environment, albeit there's still a lot to do there. But this thing has, has introduced um, some new opportunities for enterprises in that with these new tools, they've discovered that they do, their employers are, their employees are now working from home. They have the collaboration tools, they have the tool sets to know if their employees are online or not. And what they're discovering is that their employees are actually getting a lot more work done. And 74% um, of those employers who have been surveyed at some point when we get past this are going to stay or have some level of work from home um, permanently and or some um, hybrid model where work from home or work in the office options available to to their their employees and there's a whole bunch of things going on here that that give businesses advantages you know number one they discovered um, not just through this scenario but recent surveys and and case studies that were done way before this had happened enterprises were saving as much as a thousand dollars per employee per month 
Now multiply that by 200,000 employees and how much money could an enterprise save by putting in place some level of a hybrid remote from work remotely or work in the office scenario. The, the cost savings for enterprises is huge. In addition to that, us as human beings and us as employees also have an advantage. We're not faced with long drive commutes. We're not faced with going out to lunches and all kinds of other expenses that come with having to go into the office on a daily basis. So we save anywhere between 4K and $7,000. And we also, enterprises, have also discovered, like I said earlier, that they are getting more out of their employees in that they've seen a increase in production go up by 79%. And um, other numbers that aren't represented here, um, employees cited that they had uh, about almost 80% cited less stress. Um, because they're not sitting in traffic and commuting. And a lot of them also mentioned that they had a better work-life balance, right? So imagine you're able to accommodate that work-life balance with um, your, your working from home. Um, so lots of advantages that, that employers or enterprises can have and employees. And so now with this new remote option that we have. Now we've introduced other um, needs that we need to accommodate and fulfill for and consider, right? So now with the new remote work or e-learning or telehealth, you name it, um, every single um, vertical is looking at how to deploy their employees in some level of remote environment, whether it's across countries, around the world, on whatever continent, on a boat, in a train, wherever it may be. They might be in offices, they might be in homes. Um, they're going to be on any kind of device. And that has you know, put forth all kinds of other um, requirements for enterprises to consider. Security is the number one, number one um, thing they need to accomplish. Scalability, right? They imagine now that we've all have availability from anywhere on any device. Imagine the information or content or 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 information that that's now creating, which is causing a, a lot of um, requirements for more capacities and larger networks and. Um, you know, virtual desktops have been something that's been in place for quite a while, right? And so now we also have to uh, account for, um, I look at power users um, and or those who are using uh, media and entertainment, large files, CAD files, and imagine the bandwidth they need and what, how we need to solve for that. And virtual desk um, infrastructure or VDI um, is the perfect solution to, to help accommodate that. So I think there's a couple different things to consider. And, and through the course of COVID, we've discovered that customers have, have options. And depending on whether or not they're going to go up into the cloud because, one, they have an immediate need, they can't wait for that equipment to show up on the dock, or maybe it gets on the dock and they can't deploy it, or they're, they have to take an immediate turn like we did with COVID and do the unplanned, unthinkable action, which is send all of your employees, all of your students home and ask them to gain access to your environment and continue your business operations status quo, right? And the fastest way most enterprises accommodated that was they looked to the public cloud because of its simplicity. They didn't have to do CapEx CapEx purchases. They didn't have to wait for equipment to, to show up on the docks. And um, it was a quick option for a lot of enterprises who needed to keep business operations functional and keep their employees in um, working. And, um, you know, cloud was a great option. Um, but there are still on-premises options and requirements. And, um, you know, whether you're on-prem or whether you're in the cloud, um, we as NetApp look at, we could have a hybrid model, right? So you, you may have a situation where you still need to be close to that data set or close to those large files. You, you may need to have quick access, or maybe you're looking at deploying and consolidating an environment, which would include your VDI 
installation and you may need an option of GPUs or CPUs and you know that's one thing we pride ourselves on is giving our enterprises and our customers flexibility whether you're on the cloud or in the cloud or on-premise or you need to accomplish both scenarios let's say you've gone to the cloud and and you need to pull that data back on-prem now that we've returned back to some level of maybe normalcy or whatever you might have to call it but we have flexibilities and we have options. And I'm going to turn this over now to Chris Rodriguez, who is our VDI expert in architecture in the field. He's going to talk to us a little bit more about some of the options we've given our customers to accommodate their virtual desktop infrastructures. Great presentation. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. And now I'll hand it over to Chris from NetApp. Well, thanks. By the way, everybody at NetApp calls me C-Rod, and that's what I'm commonly known in the VDI circles. Got that nickname a long time ago, so um, well, let's get started. I've been doing VDI at, at NetApp for a long time, for um, uh, 13 years roughly, three years as a reseller contractor, and then 10 years as a full-time employee. And um, I've seen a lot, lot in the world in VDI, and it really has changed. COVID-19 has changed that game in VDI. It's a major game changer. And since this happened, as Cindy, you know, to, to add to what Cindy just said, since this happened, uh, back in February in the U.S. and in January, pretty much the rest of the world, I've been saying all along in all my presentations that it's not work from home is not going to go away. There's going to be too many factors that once co corporations get it set up and, and uh, that a big percentage of it, maybe 25% of it, will still stay work from home, while uh, the other 75% may go back to work, or maybe another uh, or, or another percentage of it will be half and half. So let's talk about this specifically, why I believe that uh, it's good, VDI is here to stay after the pandemic is uh, cured and underway. Well, first of all, some of the things that I'm seeing in the marketplace today is do-it-yourself VDI is no more. You know, um, they don't want to go through lengthy purchases. They don't want to go through lengthy deployments. They want to bring it up really quick, okay? In some cases, there's needs to keep it on-premise security cases, uh, resources, and so on and so forth. But for the most part, for standard VDI users, they want to be able to give it to them anytime, any place, and anywhere with any device, okay? So that's, that's very important. And it's, it's, as I mentioned, it's got to be a managed service, okay? Whether in cloud or whether on-prem. And then quick deployment, that's really important right now, especially during the current pandemic. So let's talk about a little bit about uh, a hybrid cloud software model with, with NetApp and what we support. Obviously, we support Citrix Workspace ONE and Citrix Hybrid Cloud with the Hybrid Cloud Connector. We support VMware Workspace ONE and Azure Virtual Desktop. And by the way, I said Citrix Workspace ONE. I apologize. I meant to say Citrix Workspace. So um, then we also support the new, new kit on the block, Microsoft's Azure Windows Virtual Desktop. It's based on Windows 10 multi-session, and it's getting a lot of uh, press and a lot of enterprises, a lot of global customers. A lot of customers are testing it out and kicking the tires with it right now. Okay. Also, last week, if you didn't know, didn't hear, we um, just announced that we acquired Cloud Jumper, which is a cloud-based VDI man management control plane for Microsoft's uh, uh, Windows Virtual Desktop VDI. Okay, it's for uh, virtual desktop administrators. If you use, we have two services off that. We have the virtual desktop service, and then we have the virtual desktop managed service. So even though the trend is going towards managed, we, we uh, still support the existing do-it-yourselfers, those who want to do it themselves. And we have a, a virtual desktop service, and that's what that's for. Um, it's, it's for virtual desktop administrators. You can use uh, WVD or RDS either one of those uh, VDI type provisioning methods. They're both, uh, one's Windows 10 session-based VDI and the other's uh, server-based VDI. And then we have uh, open cloud, so it means that we can support multiple different clouds, okay? Uh, Azure, uh, Am uh, Amazon, as well as um, Google Cloud. And you can get it for as low as $12 a month. Makes things very easy. And the nice thing about it, it's integrated with our Azure NetApp files, and integrated with our Cloud Insights and other products in cloud that you can utilize from NetApp in a full bundle. This is a, a one picture. It's kind of a, a um, 
congested picture, but it is a picture that shows all our different cloud products in for the cloud piece. And so you can see everything is built around Azure NetApp files. And we have global cache, cloud backup service, cloud insight, SaaS, and compliance. And then virtual desktop is the new kid in the block. And we call this now NetApp's modern workplace platform on Azure. Okay, very exciting news. Since the announcement last week, we've had many, many account teams tell us that customers want to hear about this product that we just acquired. Okay, this is an example of uh, NetApp's hybrid cloud with uh, the Citrix cloud connector on Azure. As you can see, there's the Citrix control plane. You have the Citrix HC connector. I really like the Citrix solution on cloud because it's very versatile. It has some very advanced features uh, that you can utilize with it. And it does use our on-premise HCI product as well as it'll use Azure or all three hyperscalers too in the cloud. And again, they run in the cloud with our Azure NetApp files and some of our other cloud products to take advantage. Azure NetApp files is six times faster than any other cloud file system out there. And it handles the VDI workloads. I've had many customers that have contacted us and I have, they, they asked me to talk to them and I talked to them and find out they're having performance problems and they're not getting their profiles or whatever the case may be. We move them over to Azure NetApp files from other, whatever other file system they were in and, and it works right out of the box, fast, very fast. And of course, on premise, we also stay, stay with simplicity with our HCI product and use the hybrid cloud connectors. So for our partnerships on premise now, we're going to move from the cloud into on premise if you're doing a hybrid cloud model. And we support or we have partnerships with Citrix, Zenapp, Zen Desktop, Beamware View, and Mechdyne and Teradici as well. And we use them for graphic protocols. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about graphic protocols. This is a, a solution that you would probably click, keep on premise because it's very demanding. It requires GPUs and NVIDIA GPUs inside the servers. Usually there's large graphic files and large image files. Okay, sometimes they have 8K resolution. I have a customer that I just worked with in Detroit and they're rolling out our HCI platform with our GPUs right now because they have 8K uh, resolution. We came up at NetApp, we came up with a solution to, to address uh, oil and grass graph graphics about six years ago and now it's moved over to our all our other segments healthcare engineering media and entertainment and the one i'm talking about earlier that i was mentioning that they had an 8k resolution that was for media and entertainment okay so here's that app vdi solution it solves all those problems that you have with high high powered workstations for uh for the endpoint that you need to put in you want to move into a VDI solution, and that's what we do, is we take these big powered workstations that are expensive. They're anywhere from $10,000 to $100,000, depending upon what type of vertical it is. Okay, we take that 8K, 4K HD resolution, multiple 4K monitors requirements, and we move all those workstations inside the computer room in a VDI scenario with our, um, in a VDI solution with our HCI product. And then we can access it locally or remote. Last year at a large conference, when we had conferences uh, on that we could attend uh, <coughs> I, in, in San Francisco, I demoed 8K resolution and I was connecting over uh, 1,500 miles away. We had our HCI pod in a data center that was over 15 miles, 1,500 miles away. I can, at my house right now, I'm based in North Texas and I have four 4K monitors that I demo from. So again, it mitigates all these issues, data security, when you bring those high powered workstations into the, the, the data center, you, you have security. We, we require very low bandwidth to do this, literally to under 10 megabits down to be able to access these image files and these applications real time, okay? Network power outages are no longer a problem and so on and so forth. One thing that we're getting a lot of requests on lately, I used to, I, I have this in my signature line. I used to think it was just a marketing tagline and kind of cute, but it actually is practical. I've had several customers ask me, uh, hey, do you have a node that we can use, a GPU node that we can use to be able to do VDI during business hours and after hours we can run computational against it. And so I, this has is a reality. I understand why NVIDIA came out with the T4s that handles that. And yes, we have a node that handles that with multiple that use case with multiple um, NVIDIA T4s in it. And these are some of the areas on the right that you can see that we address, healthcare, 
autonomous vehicle, oil and gas, casino, AI solutions. That's a neat, neat thing that's going on. They're using that for um, face recognition. So that if they've got somebody that's cheating the casino, they can recognize them real quick and ask them to leave. And they also use it for progression uh, detection to see if there's teams out there working uh, and by progression. If you saw that movie about the, 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 the young graduates from MIT went out and, and beat Vegas for about $3 million, that's what this, this now these AI solutions prevent. So with all this said in our hybrid cloud solution, again, to summarize, you can bring up uh, VDI desktop sessions very fast in the cloud. There is no infrastructure procurement process. There is no infrastructure uh, deployment process. So literally we had a customer bring them, bring a deploy a department up in about four hours on cloud. And then later on, if you decide you want to migrate those desktops from cloud to on-premise, you can do that very easily. Or if you just have workloads that need to stay on-prem and you still want to keep your, uh, your majority of your VDI desktops in the cloud, you can do that too with NetApp. We're very open with that, but we do have five uh, migration tools that make it very easy to move your SIFs and profiles requirements of VDI. And that's what makes NetApp number one, our versatile solutions in VDI. And we are number one in VDI according to VDI Like a Pro. We have more VDI desktops running on NetApp storage. We have the, the three largest VDI implementations in the world. I was involved in one of them. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, David. Great presentation, Chris and Cindy as well. Um, Let's do some Q&A now. We've got some good questions coming in from the audience. While we do that, I'm just going to bring up this poll question uh, for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the NetApp solution? So uh, Chris and Cindy, are you there? We're here. Yes. I'm here. Yes. Awesome. All right. So uh, really cool stuff in the presentation. We've got some questions coming in. Uh, first one I wanted to ask you, and you know, feel free to, uh, whoever this applies to best, uh, just grab it. Um, Greg is asking, I use VMware Horizon View. Can I use Horizon View in the cloud with NetApp? Sure, I'll take that one. So, um, yeah, yes, you can. You can, you can use uh, Horizon View in the cloud, and um, you can use our Azure NetApp files. It's, it's Azure NetApp files is six times faster file system than any other file system in the cloud. We've had customers that have tempted it with other ones, and they usually end up having to um, come back to us, and we run it. The, the difference is we go directly to our storage. So it's not a file system that sits on top of a cloud operating system that then sits on top of another storage company's storage operating system. So you don't have that three level of tiers. And we don't have to write metadata or indexing, as they say, file indexing at the top. We go straight to our storage. So all our I.O. goes straight to our storage in the cloud providers, and we um, write the met metadata straight on storage. So it's very, very fast, sub-millisecond speed. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Another question here, uh, let's see, Frank is asking, Windows Virtual Desktop is only supported in Azure. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not sure I followed that one. That looks like a comment, um, which I'll route to Chris. Well, there, but... let, let, let me answer that because sometimes I, I okay. hear that come okay. up at times. And I think I, I'm, I'm ciphering out what they're asking. Uh, they're asking, I guess, is uh, can you run Windows Virtual Desktop, Microsoft's Windows Virtual Desktop, either uh, in another cloud provider or on your on-premise equipment? And the answer to that is no. Microsoft developed that. Um, it, on Windows 10, it's VDI on Windows 10 and not on server session based like Terminal Services or RDS. And so it's it's uh, Windows 10 session based, so apps, desktop apps run better on it, and you get more apps to run on it. But they developed that only in Azure, very similar to Office 365 and, and, and Exchange and SQL is what they're doing. And by the way, they've declared, Microsoft declared they're only putting new features uh, for in, in Windows 10 uh, WVD from this point forward, going forward, just to let everyone know. So they're very serious about putting the desktop in Azure, in the cloud. Okay, okay, got it, makes sense, yeah. Uh, see, another question that came in, they're asking, what public clouds does NetApp work with? Cindy, you wanna take that one? Yeah, yeah, so um, NetApp works with all of the public clouds. We have deep-seated relationships with Google and Amazon and um, Microsoft as well. Nice. A lot of flexibility there. 
All mm -hmm. right. Um, Daniel said, this is the type of system we need here where I work. <laughs> so some good yeah. feedback there. He liked what he heard. Um, next question they're asking, can I really have uh, users, uh, can I really have my graphics applications users work from home? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that one because I've been working with graphic apps and a lot of companies lately on that. Uh, so obviously with, you know, with COVID-19, engineers are not able to use their CATIA and all their graphic apps, you know, and same thing with um, seismic and oil and gas and, and media and entertainment, the graphic artists, they're all having issues. We we have been at NetApp selling tons of our um, HCI uh, systems with our uh, graphic cards in them, a whole bunch right now. And we came up with a solution about six years ago at NetApp, was with our FlexPod product originally, where um, we co-developed or helped you know, tested out, worked with it, and gave them the specs to the software company that we partnered with and came out with a very low bandwidth product, uh, a, a protocol. So you can use it on, on – you can do graphic uh, requirements, graphic apps requirements, remotely over the Internet from the house. People ask me all the time, what's the minimum megabits we need? Well, if you're doing just 4K resolution, single monitor, uh, you can get by with 5 to 10 megabits with a solution. And I demo that all the time in, in, in uh, at the conferences. If you're doing multiple multiple 4K monitors, you can do up to with a solution four 4K monitors, or you're doing an 8K monitor, which is what I did uh, at VMworld last year. Then you're going to need a little higher. You need about 20 megabits down. That's still extreme, extremely well performance. And I've got one company right now that is doing um, uh, high-end resolution multiple 4K monitors, and they tell their users to have anywhere between 30 and 50 megabits down just to be on the safe side. Okay, so to answer your question, yes. We, you can do it, and, we, and that's our fastest growing market right now for us. Nice, nice. So, I mean, when people think about NetApp, they gener generally think of storage. Um, but when companies have these VDI challenges, uh, Sierra, maybe you can give us an example of, you know, how does NetApp do more than just provide a storage array? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, we started as a storage company. I've been with NetApp for a long time, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation. And um, you know, over over time, we transition from storage to other products. We some through acquisitions and some through uh, own innovation and then self innovation, organic innovation, should I say? And then, in addition to that, recently, you know, I'd say in the last three years, five years, we're transitioning more to a solution based company. A lot of our software, a lot of our products have been software defined. Our storage products. So like, for instance, for those on the call that know NetApp and know Untap, you know, the old command liners like I am, we, you know, we have Untap now available in, in the cloud. You know, that's what's running an a and Azure NetApp Files, is it runs on our storage that's in, in Azure. If you use CVS, it's running on our cloud volume uh, service. It's running on our, our storage in, in there, in, uh, in either in Google or in Amazon. Okay, and if you're clear, you're used to the command line untap, you can get CBO, which is the full-blown version of untap. So, same thing with uh, the rest of our products. We're going software-defined with many of our products right now. So, so we're more than just a storage company these days. We're truly our solutions company. And with the acquisition of Cloud Jumper and, and all the cloud products that we have, we 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 prove that with the solutions that we provide there. Nice. So you're saying with Azure NetApp Files, I don't have to have a physical NetApp array on premises. I can use Azure NetApp Files just by going to the Azure Cloud. That's right, and you get the same performance, the same robustness, the same stability, and and 30 years of experience of storage with it. But it's very easy to use. And here's the cool thing: with Virtual Desktop Service, NetApp's new Virtual Desktop Service, which was formerly Cloud Jumper. You can now do VDI in the cloud using Azure Net Files, and it will. You can either do it as I mentioned earlier as a, as a DIY where you do it yourself, or you can have a managed service where one of our partners will manage the whole thing for you and deploy the desktops and do everything for you. Excellent, excellent. All right. Well, um, maybe final question here that we have time for, I think, is how should people get started with NetApp? What, what do you recommend? Cindy, you want to take that one? Yeah, um, several ways. You can come and visit us at netup.com, of course, and reach out to any one of our sales reps and or um, come and see us at uh, netup.cloud.com. Um, and, and you have our contact information, uh, C-Rod and myself. 
uh, both are willing to help and, and enabled to get you started as quickly as possible. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on today. Thank you so much, Cindy and Chris. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Yes, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you to NetApp for supporting today's event. Uh, like Cindy said, you know, visit netapp.com. Also check out the resource that's available there for download in your audience console. In fact, it, it's actually a, a link to the NetApp desktop virtualization site where you can get more information on the NetApp VDI solution and give it a try for yourself. And with that, it is time for our final Amazon $500 gift card giveaway on the event today. That is going out to Ed Fabian from Missouri. Congratulations, Ed Fabian from Missouri, as well as our previous two winners on today's EcoCast. Before you go, I want to remind you to subscribe to the 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store. If you would like to talk with Actual Tech Media about presenting on a future EcoCast or Megacast event, email us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And finally, I hope that you'll join us on next week's big event. That is the Enterprise Storage and Hyperconvergence Megacast, where you'll hear from Nutanix, Pure Storage, Cohesity, and Datrium. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on today's EcoCast when it comes to optimizing your virtual infrastructure. Hope that you learned a lot and had a good time. I know that I did. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.